controlling position. Now Thomas will try and jive around Phil Robertson's bow. I'm sorry, Robertson rather. Now things have switched around. Thomas, the lured boat, hooking Robertson, trying to pin him away from the line. 30 seconds to go. Okay, so it looks like uh, Robertson far enough to windward that he can uh, avoid the hook there. And now, now he's uh, coming bow up. And uh, how's their timing? About 15 seconds to go. And it looks like uh, because they're sailing up current, no penalties outstanding. It sounds like maybe there was one. Three seconds to go. And there they go, pulling the trigger. And there goes Robertson rolling over the top, flying a hull. Beautiful start yep. for Robertson and China One Ningbo crew. They'll turn that speed in, into a wind shadow and slow their opponent down. Robertson gaining about three boat lengths in that move, slingshotting off the start into the lead over Thomas. Great start by Phil Robertson. And again, you can see the, uh, when they get the puffs, man, these boats accelerate so quick. But then uh, almost as equally, as, uh, as fast as they accelerate, they are prone to parking up in these conditions also. So uh, here we go. It's Phil Robertson approaching the top mark in first with about a three boat length lead over Steve Thomas. And as you mentioned, Scotty, in the first match, we're likely to see lots of lead changes in this compressed, short, and very light and shifty race course. So Robertson might be out in front but it's far from a comfortable lead in these conditions as he leads Thomas on starboard downwind. Exclusion zone coming up and we're gonna see a jibe. So here we go for the jibe now. It's Steve Thomas jibing. You can see Phil Robertson electing to carry on there and changing sides. Uh, Robertson jibing. Oh, big apart. Sorry, Ro Ro Robertson in front. Thomas electing to carry on. So it's a game of cat and mouse, isn't it? So they've gone. It's Phil Robertson elected to go to the right hand side, and that's the uh, that's the side that seemed to pay dividends in the last race. Certainly, Robertson powered up there and and looking pretty good. Not quite flying a hole, but moving nicely. Best speed on the course right now. Phil Robertson and crew setting up to tack. Robertson himself releases the old sheet on the Jenniker. The crew pulls the bow through the eye of the wind and rehoists Robertson off now on starboard. We'll have a look at where Thomas is to see if it's been a gain from that right hand side, Scotty. So it looks like Thomas just tacked onto port there and he looks reasonably well pressured up, moving nicely. Again, a little puff goes a long way. Look at, look at Thomas ripping out of the left-hand side of the racetrack. So it looks like uh, maybe Phil Robertson still in the lead, but Thomas right back into it. Only about four boat lengths between them now. That's the top mark on the left side. And is Phil Robertson laying? Will he make it without tacking? Tough to tell how close he is in this angle, but I'm, I'm sure he's got it there. It'll be a left-hand turn around the left-hand top mark to head downwind again. Phil Robertson's race to lose at this point. Uh, safety to race committee, what about the uh, reach? <coughs> so, there's Thomas tacking oh, for the uh, top mark. So, Phil Robertson with a sizable lead. Robertson already jibed, and I think he's just trying to get, I won't call it downwind, but I'll call it, uh, how about down Palace? Hmm. Getting further away from Winter Palace and uh, hopefully getting a little breeze up and over the top. And there's that breeze, Scotty. A good puff has his bow down pointing closer to the next mark and eventually the finish line. Now Thomas jiving to follow in that same puff, trying to keep the game close enough to catch up. If Robertson wins this match, he'll even the score and force a final sail off to see who will move on to the quarterfinals as he jibes for the lured gate in a light puff of breeze. So Phil Robertson doing a nice job. You can see Robertson there in the foreground on starboard and Steve Thomas in the background. So Robertson's really done a nice job of increasing his lead downwind. 
and it's really getting down and around this lured gate that has been the uh, the critical point so far because now Robertson is uh, with the current. And Thomas just there behind knows that his chances to win this match are diminishing rapidly. Another jive will slow him down as Robertson heads for home. Nice uh, view of the, uh, the commentary tent there with the Peter and Paul fortress in the background. And uh, again, another spectacular shot as uh, Phil Robertson approaches the finish. And there it and is. And there he is across the line. That's awesome. Great win for Phil Robertson to tie it up at two points each. Absolutely. A much needed win. As Robertson was two to zero down to Thomas yesterday. Now he's back in the game. And the next match will decide it all for the world champion or for Thomas looking to knock him out. Our next match coming up will be Kim Kling and Peter Jan Postma, the dark blue boat and the red boat. But before we do that, Scotty, let's do a replay of that match and find out where Robertson gained the advantage. Upwind, Robertson in blue. Crossing Thomas there. No. There's the finish line. And that's him taking the race. Let's put it this way, Scotty. It was a wire-to-wire -wire win from the start right to the finish. Yeah, it really was. It was a uh, great start by uh, Phil Robertson and um, got, got his nose in front, did what he needed to do. And, um, man, the, 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 the conditions out here are so challenging. Uh, I think... Um, yeah, Thomas had one opportunity to uh, to close in downwind, but uh, when I say an opportunity, uh, maybe half an opportunity. So uh, Robertson playing it by the book, staying in the breeze and just keeping the boat moving. Um, so yeah, we're all tied up at two points each. Now you're looking at the dark blue boat on the left. That's our next match, Kim Kling and Posma all the way to the right in red. Peter Jan Posma is on an upward trajectory. He finished 16th in Australia. He finished fourth in Sweden. He won his qualifying group here in Russia. And now he's looking to move on into the quarterfinals. There is a success story from the young team from the Netherlands. But here's an update. from now on will be first to two wins. Okay, so there you have it from Matthias Dahlstrom. The principal race officer has now changed the uh, racing. So it's no longer a best of three, best of five rather, first to win three match series. It is now a best of three or first to win two for everybody yet to sail on the race course. And that's a good call in these light airs so that we can catch up on the racing schedule. Exactly. So just to clarify, it is Robertson and Thomas currently at uh, two points each. So their match will be obviously the first to win three, but all the remaining matches in the Super 16 will be the first to win two. Okay. Very light conditions. And uh, we're just, uh, the boats are just milling around waiting for race committee instructions waiting for the sequence but you can see the uh, the red boat on the right I think that's Postma and when they sit there and go head to wind you can see them drifting uh, up the river with the current which is uh, probably a, a, a decent two knots I would say Scotty I know that you've sailed in what is it 18 congressional cups and many other match races around the world have you ever raced and match raced here in Russia uh, I have match raced here in Russia. I did an event in uh, Ekaterinburg back in uh, 97. Uh, that was a while ago now. But, um, yeah, fantastic sailing, small boats, um, light air, and uh, very, 
very, very challenging. But they, the thing I love about these events is they're becoming more stadium sailing. I mean, that the event I did was uh, it was on a lake, and the uh, yeah, it was uh, it was good conditions. But um, this this format of stadium sailing, uh, it's it's not about having a clear racetrack and clean breeze and predictable wind shifts. It's almost the opposite. So it's just um, throw as many curveballs at the teams as you can, and everybody's facing uh, the same conditions. But um, it certainly makes for a great spectacle. It makes it more exciting for us, and it certainly makes it more challenging and more exciting for the sailors as well to be compressed inshore in this exciting match racing format. Four minutes to go to the start between Peter Jan Postma and Kim Kling, the Netherlands versus Sweden as Match Cup Russia continues here in beautiful St. Petersburg. I understand Vladimir Putin was here a few days ago. Too bad he couldn't stick around to watch Match Cup Russia sailing right here on the river. We had four minutes up. So we we're approaching the three minute mark to the start, the entry. Peter Jan Postma, also one of the most entertaining gentlemen on the tour, one of the nicest guys in the sport, and it's good to see him doing so well, Scotty. Not, hey. to, be, not to play favorites between these two, <laughs> but he really is a cool, cool cat for the sport of match racing. Well, certainly uh, your interviews with him, he seems to be enjoying his sailing, doesn't he? And, uh, and that would, uh, fr from what we've seen in the past, the, the teams that are that are enjoying themselves also tend to have the good results. Good point. I've never seen Phil Robertson have a bad time <laughs> or a lack of a smile. He's done well so far in these M32 catamarans, light air or heavy air, doesn't matter. Two minutes, 35 seconds to go, coming up on the 32nd mark to the pre-start entry. Red boat to our right will enter below the signal boat, the white boat that is running the races, and the dark blue boat to windward. Kim Kling will enter to the uh, above the boat, rather. So that's an interesting uh, camera <laughs> shot there, Tucker. You can see the uh, flag, the Russian flag over the top, streaming quite nicely. But uh, I suspect the teams down on the water can't see that. I uh, believe that's uh, in the background behind the palace. So really, the, um, the, the teams don't have a lot of indication as to uh, the breeze that's coming or what's on top of them. There's the, uh, the pre-start entry. Have a look at the next flag, Scott, to the right-hand side, giving exactly. you an idea of the difference there, doesn't it? in breeze. Big puff, and that's probably the puff that was on the flag just 10 seconds ago that you pointed out, Scott. We're into the pre-start, minute 40 seconds to go. So the game of cat and mouse begins. It is Kling in the dark blue hull, still with his Jenica uh, deployed, staying deep. And Postma in the red boat putting his bow up and seeing if uh, Kling will commit above him. And again, every time you see the boats put their bow down, they drift to the right quite quickly. When they put their bow up towards the starting line, they don't make that much progress uh, back towards the line, and that's because of the current. Just adding to the challenge, that these sailors have to contend with, and as Ooh. we just talked about earlier, so, they prefer it. So that was a, uh, might have been a, a, uh, an error in judgment by Kling there. I think he um, put his bow down, thought he was going to be able to go behind Postma, but now fully locked in. So this is where I would expect uh, Kling to really park up. Let's see what happens. Man, both boats absolutely stopped. Not a lot of breeze at all. The speed is dropping, time? but positionally, you'd rather be Postma. Yeah, I think so. He's already got his bow down. You can see Kling's team backing their Jenica just to get their bow down to an acceleration angle. 15 seconds to go, so I think uh, Postma will be in a strong position here. But look at the acceleration on Kling right there, and that's what is so dangerous about these conditions is... Ooh. There's, and there's the, the puff. What a... What an interesting start. That could have been either boat, but it's it's Postma with his bow across the line first. They're off to the races. Both boats flying a hull. 
And that's encouraging to see. It, it, it's, uh, the, this is going to be a close one. Interesting that the trailing boat, Kling, got that puff first, and then it moved sort of forward to P.J. Postma, who got lucky enough to keep the overlap from happening and keep Kling behind him as he leads into Mark 1. Yeah, that was very interesting indeed. It looked like Kling, uh, as Tucker said, he, he got the puff first. He accelerated up on the... Uh, uh, up flying a hull, and uh, I think he he had a look in um, to Lewitt, but oh. and here he goes again as Kling. Nice acceleration <laughs> around the mark as Postma parks up, that. and Kling going straight over the top. Unbelievable. So uh, Postma thought he was doing the safe thing, but um, a little puff goes a long way in these conditions, and that's lead change. Kling now in charge of the race giving us a solid idea of just how challenging these conditions are. Your leader on the right-hand side, parked up with no breeze, and Kling, who was trailing, just slingshotted forward. Now he'll slow down. Whichever boat gets the next puff is likely to lead downwind here. This is a waiting game. Kling, however, managing to hold on to some momentum, and that's just advantaging him a little farther ahead. Now, Scotty, when he jibes for the bottom mark, he's going to be on port under the rules. That could open the door for Postma unless he gets into the zone at the mark first. Yep, anything could happen here, Tucker. It's Like you said, it's a waiting game. Who's going to get that little puff, that bit of acceleration? Oh, he's actually laying it, isn't he? Yep, it looks like they're going to opposite gates. So you'll see Postma put his bow down, and that's a very close rounding indeed. Um, so both boats going opposite sides of the course. Postma heading to the right, and we've seen that's the side that's been paying so far, but we've also seen big puffs come out of the left as well. Well, right now I think the first puff on this upwind leg definitely has gone to Peter Jan Postma here in the red boat. You look in the background, Kling. Look at the hull flying there. For Pideon Postma is definitely up to speed. Kling is only just getting his own puff behind on the left-hand side. It was even at the bottom of the track, Scotty, but I think I'd put my money on this boat to be in the lead at this point. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. But again, every time these boats tack, and here goes Postma right now, when they tack, they, they stop, and it's all about who accelerates next. So Postma on starboard, but here comes Kling flying out of the left-hand side of the track. And then now Kling puts his bow up. Postman just starting to accelerate now. This one, this cross is going to be close. But it's Postma still in control. Interesting how Postma held the Jenniker furled up coming out of that tack. Because he had speed going through the tack. But when he came out, he didn't. If he if he uh, unfurled it too fast, I think it would have actually created drag before it filled. So he waited for his VMG speed to slow down, and then hoist the Jenniker, reduce the wind windage and drag, and then reaccelerate. Either way, it worked. Yeah, uh, I'm sure there's certainly different light air techniques that people are trying. That's Postma rounding the top mark on starboard, and let's uh, see if he can get away from under the palace walls there. Doing a nice job at the moment. This is the uh, the final <coughs> downwind. And uh, a little bit of breeze here goes a long way because uh, going downwind also means battling the current. So as long as the boat's moving, Postma will feel somewhat uh, confident in staying in control of the race. The goal, if you have pressure, if you have speed, is to get up current whenever you can in these light conditions so that when the breeze drops, at least you don't have to fight it twice as much. Just keeping that momentum going on a light air downwind run, Peter Jan Postma with two guys forward on the hulls, heads for the final turning mark. Ahead but no lead can never be big enough in these very shifty conditions. And we'll see if... Uh, Kling can reel Postma back in. First to win two now in the Super 16 matchups. 
Yeah, you can see Kling's done quite well. He's moving uh, nicely in the background, but Postma just needs to get his bow down and around this uh, final lured gate, and he'll be pointing at the finish line. So far, so good. For the Dutch team, just off of the Peter and Paul Fortress to Leward and heading for the finish line. Peter Jan Postma. There's a look at our commentary booth, Scotty, the only one without a window. <laughs> But everyone else can see Peter Jan Postma winning the race, one up over Kim Kling. And here comes Kling. He's got a big puff of breeze, but it is too little and too late for this match. There's Palsma and Kling. And they're going to wait for the next match to start. We're going to wait and see if we can get a radio down to PJ Palsma and talk to him about that win here in St. Petersburg as he looks to move on in Match Cup Russia. Super 16 qualifying round. Once again, if you're just joining us, I'm Tucker Thompson along with Scott Dixon, match racing superstar from Long Beach, California. He's flown all the way in to join us here on the commentary. We're broadcasting to you live from St. Petersburg, Russia, the first time a World Match Race Tour event has been here, the Neva River in St. Petersburg. History in the background and match racing history in the foreground. And this day number four of Match Cup Russia. So we've just received word that PJ Postma is ready for us. We're going to go down to the water and hear from the man himself who just won that last race. Peter Jan Postma, can you hear us? <laughs> hey, listen, uh, great job out there. You know, we've been making a lot of your upward trajectory in these regattas so far, and yet again, You've uh, impressed us. Can, can you hear us? See if he can hear us. Can you hear us out there, PJ? Let's see if we can hear him. But great job in that race, PJ. You know, we've made a lot of, uh, about your upward trajectory in a lot of these matches, and you continue to impress us again. How difficult was that race? Uh, I mean, here with Selig Team and L, with Herman, Juan, and Thijs, I mean, we worked hard, and it is really tricky here on the St. Petersburg on the river with lots of current and shifts. Um, but I think we're happy. Yes, we're happy. <laughs> yeah, hi PJ, Scotty Dixon here. Um, you, you mentioned the current is a huge factor and the, uh, but the breeze also, uh, it's uh, difficult. Can you see any shifts coming? Do you have any indications of what the breeze is doing on the water? Yeah, I mean, we're looking at all the flags around this river here. We got the, on the right one, a big flag, just above your left shoulder, a big flag. And so we look a lot of times on the water and outside. And I think with that information, we try just to make the most out of it. Well, you certainly made the most out of that first race, PJ. Good luck in the rest of the racing this afternoon here in St. Petersburg. Thank you. The team is very happy. Thank you. As you'd expect. I don't think I've ever seen Peter Jan Postma unhappy, but um, he's a little bit happier <laughs> after winning that match here with the city front of St. Petersburg as the backdrop. And as he mentioned, he's looking at the flags that we can see atop many of the buildings, giving the sailors an idea of what shifts are likely going to drop down onto the river and trying to plan where they may come from and position their boat accordingly. Next match is going to be Stephen Thomas and Phil Robertson tied at two all, a must win situation match point for both teams. Will it be the current world champion moving on into the quarterfinal round or will Stephen Thomas upset 
the world rank number one match racing team. Scotty, who's your money on? Well, it's a Kiwi-Aussie battle, isn't it? So uh, I'm sure the uh, New Zealand commentators probably going to say the Kiwis. So uh, that'd be Phil Robertson. But certainly both teams sailing exceptionally well. Certainly Steve Thomas impressed us all yesterday with his, uh, his boat handling. But again, yesterday, yesterday's conditions compared to today uh, could not be more contrasting. We had um, steep waves, uh, blustery breeze. You know, the uh, racing ended up getting um, postponed because of too much wind, uh, over 25 knots, I think. Uh, but today we've had um, periods of, of no wind at all, and uh, we've gone from sailing on open water to sailing on the riverfront in downtown St. Petersburg. What an absolutely spectacular backdrop for a wonderful event. So there is the pre-start four-minute entry period, the Albert Real clock showing 33 or three minutes 30 seconds till the start. Once again, Stephen Thomas here on the black boat, Phil Robertson in light blue, in light conditions here in St. Petersburg. Minute 12 seconds to go to the pre-start entry. So I believe that's uh, Steve Thomas we're looking at there. Is that correct, Tucker? It is. He's in the black boat. Okay. Robertson in light blue. And as you mentioned, Scotty, completely different conditions that we saw yesterday, but these guys at the top of their business here in match racing have to be ready and able to perform in any type of condition, including these very light and fluky conditions here on the Neva River. As Stephen Thomas tacks on to starboard and prepares to reach into the pre-start box to meet Phil Robertson, 30 seconds to go. So a lot, a, a lot of racing to have gotten to this point, but now it's one race and winner takes all or at least moves to the next round. 12 seconds to the entry. So there are your two teams, middle of the screen. Kind of tough to tell with the other matches waiting. But that is Phil Robertson, also on starboard, with the yellow flag entering below the signal boat, standing by to meet Thomas, who's entered above. And now both teams are into the pre-start box area. Now I'd say that's not a uh, team looking like they're going for the pre-start, is it? No. Might be. No, uh, Maybe they know something we don't, which is very <laughs> likely. Uh, Wouldn't be the first might, time. They may have it? canned that race because I don't even see Thomas. Let's have a look. No, two minutes to go. That's just a very relaxed Phil Robertson. Well, to be honest, we're not quite sure what's going on, but we're going to give you an update when we do because Robertson is not really moving there, and yet the signal boat still has two minutes, make that one to go until a start, and I'm gonna guess that start is uh, not Stephen Thomas and Phil Robertson, which means in 50 seconds, two other boats are starting. That's gotta be Evgeny Nagudnikov. Oh no, sorry, uh, Nico De La Carth and Ian Williams are green and orange. It may be that team. Yep, there they are, Scotty. Okay. <laughs> so the green boat is Nico De La Carth. The orange boat is Ian Williams, and we've got 30 seconds to the start. Williams leading, De La Carth pushing. There you go. And uh, Ian Williams um, putting his bow up now. He's trying to kill a little bit of time, but he's, uh, you can see, aggressive moves on the rudders. He's happy for his opponent to drop down into his gas. 10 seconds to go. And Williams looking very good indeed. Three, two, and there's a furl and attack. So starting on, uh, 
Oh, he's just laughing up. Oh, now. he's up and around, and now he'll be off to the races. That'll be a very strong position for Ian Williams. Beautiful job for the six-time world champion GAC Pindar team, shutting out Nico De La Carth and Chile Racing as they head into mark number one. Now, as we've seen so many times before, Scotty, the trailing boat also seems to get breeze in that pre-start area once they cross the line. So Nico De La Carth definitely close enough to attack, and we've seen lead changes in every match so far. So now Williams parking up and um, De La Carte coming on strong from Astern. We're focused on Williams now as, he, as he's approaching the top mark, but his lead certainly getting swallowed up very quickly now. No, De La Carte now parked up in that hole as, ex, as Williams accelerates around the top mark. It is... Uh, as we keep saying, Tucker, it's a minefield out there. Very. And uh, often a, uh, well, not just a sailor's nightmare, but sometimes the commentators also. <laughs> well, it might be tough for us to see what's going on, but at least we aren't, our jobs aren't on the line of whether we could move on into this match race. Almost 50,000 total cash prize dollars at stake, 16 for the winner. Could it be Ian Williams who's leading this match? Yep, Ian Williams around the lured mark and straight into attack. So he's coming to that uh, to the right side that we've seemed to have seen pay. And um, it has but there the memories. You, so there you go. It's Delacarte. He was a fair way behind, but rounded with pressure and um, possibly right back into this race. Definitely looks like it at that stage. Bow to bow, and he's got better breeze to Lacarth in the green boat, foreground here to Lured. Great camera work there, and that really tells the story. He's bow forward, bow up, really close engage, and I think we're going to see a lead change here. It's De La Carte on to starboard, but he has all but... Oh, he just stopped in the oh. water, didn't he? Lost steerage. Now let's see what Williams is, if he's going to be able to get going. Close to the exclusion zone there for De La Carte. But now he's getting up to speed. Oh, look at how challenging and fluky it is. Ian Williams, for a moment there, was behind. Now he's back out in front, and he's tacked on top of Nico De La Carte, affecting his breeze. You can see the green Jenniker luffing with disturbed air there. Actually, Williams is having the same thing, sailing into a light spot and slowing down. Now a puff again. It's just very tricky conditions to yeah. stay ahead. It's like uh, somebody's opening all the windows in the palace at the same time, and as soon as they open them, they close them again. It's, it's uh, absolutely tricky out there. And uh, the team's really going to have to be very, very patient. So Williams has tacked onto port, heading possibly for ley line with a right-hand windward gate mark as it comes into screen. There it is. Is he laying? If so, that'll be an advantage as he'll bear away onto port. He's going to have to luff Ooh. up and go into the current, and that'll slow him down as Delacarth tries to reel him in from behind. The green sails, you can see, are at speed, but they're also going to have a thin lay line, and they're going to have to luff up here to make the mark as well. Delacarth rolls into attack and a split. He'll go for the opposite gate. He's going to have to sail extra distance to do it, Scotty, but... At least he's in breeze. He's in breeze. He's accelerating. You, and you saw Williams come around uh, the, the right-hand mark and immediately jibe. So that whole maneuver uh, is very expensive um, distance-wise. But uh, it's all about who accelerates first. And, yeah, Williams downwind. And, again, I'll, I'll call it down castle, uh, which just means further away from the castle. So possibly uh, a better chance of getting one of those random puffs uh, up and over the, uh, the roof of the Winter Castle, but there is separation between the boats right now. It's all about who gets the first puff and who accelerates first, and um, boy, it's, it's anybody's game, Tucker. Very tricky out there, but at least it's enough wind to sail. And in normal monohull match racing that you and I used to do so much of in, back in the dinosaur age, Scotty, we wouldn't be able to even race in these conditions, but yet the M32s, even though it's light and tricky, are definitely competing and sailing here in St. Petersburg. 
Yeah, so you can see Williams doing a nice job to lure there on the orange jewel boat. But De La Carte right now gets a little puff, gets a little acceleration. It is uh, really a, uh, a game of dice out there, rapidly changing fortunes. But uh, Williams doing all the classic match racing covering moves. Williams, one of the one of the teams on the tour that is comfortable sailing close to the competition rather than expansively, and he's even willing to give up distance and make yes. extra maneuvers to do so and position himself relative to the competition, as you say, Scotty, making it sometimes look trick, uh, you know, more challenging and leads not as far, as far ahead as you might necessarily be comfortable with, but he's good enough to know exactly where he can place his boat and not lose too much to the competition. That's the final turning mark as Ian Williams heads for the finish line, slowly but surely in the lead over Nico de la Carte. So Williams in the lead, but uh, de la Carte with a little bit of a puff from behind, but it's such a short sprint leg to the finish, and also it's with the current, so even if there was no breeze right now, uh, fortunes probably wouldn't change. You can see Williams with his one of his crew members all the way forward. And he's just on cruise control. And uh, in fact, furling. And there he is across the finish line to go 1-0 up. That's Ian Williams takes his first point in his round of the Super 16. And a big puff of breeze for Delacarth right at the finish. But he won't get to use any of that. Having crossed the line behind, six-time world champion Ian Williams and the GAC Pindar team. Looks as though already there's some sort of issue with the sail. Three of the four crew members working on it. They've got the hired out. I'm not quite sure what they're doing, Scotty. They're lowering the uh, Jenniker. While they do that, We'll wait for an interview with Ian Williams. Every win, every point counts in these qualifying rounds and every team looking to move on into the quarterfinals of the Super 16. Only eight, of course, will be able to do that as the Match Cup Russia continues here in St. Petersburg. Ian Williams, one point up over Nico De La Carth, and this is now a first to win two matches. Williams one step closer to victory, or De La Carth could even the deal in the next match. A few minutes to go before the start of our next match, and we'll see if we can, in fact, have a radio on with uh, Williams to give him an interview or not. They're still sorting out whatever that issue is, Scotty, with the Jenniker. Yeah, I'm uh, really not sure what it could have been, Tucker. I uh, didn't see anything obvious um, on the boats on the way around the racetrack, but... Uh, they, were quick, know, they were quick to drop it, all the yeah. whole crew, right after the finish. But uh, Ian's not, uh, what is it, six-time world champion for, uh, <laughs> for no reason. Doesn't leave anything to, uh, to, to chance. And uh, here's another beautiful shot of the, uh, the Winter Palace with the M32 in the foreground. Absolutely stunning. With the palace that's stunning, it makes you wonder what the summer palace looks like. Yeah, no kidding. St. Petersburg, Russia. The next venue in the World Match Racing Tour. Four minutes to go now to the start of Stephen Thomas. This time against Phil Robertson again. Tied at 2-all. They started out their matches in a first to win three, best of five. So that stays. The rest of the teams will be first to win two, best of three. Super 16 qualifying round. So whoever wins this match will go on to the quarterfinals of Match Cup Russia. Sudden death. Winner take all. Or at least winner move on. <clears throat> so Phil Robertson, the current world champion, having also won the last two events in the M32 Catamarans here on the World Match Racing Tour. First in Perth, Australia, then again in Sweden. 
Phil Robertson proving the team to beat has been on a roll so far on the World Match Racing Tour. Stephen Thomas has a thing or two to say about that. He'll try and knock him out and send the world champion home if he can win this match. Thomas was sent home in the last regatta in Sweden by Phil Robertson, and he looks to even the score. 40 seconds to go to the pre-start. It will be Stephen Thomas here with the blue flag and the black boat entering above the signal boat and this boat in the foreground, light blue, is Phil Robertson, who will enter below the signal boat in about 25 seconds. There's the signal boat, the white power boat to the right. That's the windward end of the starting line. In 2 minutes, 15 seconds, both boats will cross that line. And you can see them each slow now, just preparing for the acceleration into the pre-start box. Robertson with the Jenniker out, already up to full speed. And now here comes Stephen Thomas. Two minutes to go. Well, there's the entry, and uh, this is the match we've been waiting for, Tucker, for probably more than 24 hours now, and it just uh, seems like it, every match that's been coming up, this is going to be the decider, and is, is this the one where, where Thomas is able to beat the current world champion? And uh, Thomas must be thinking, what does it take to make this guy go away? It's 1.35 to go now, and it's Robertson to Leward, and he's uh, protecting the, the low ground, uh, aggressive rudder movements, and just um, just parking up. He's, uh, now it's just a game of cat and mouse. Robertson likes to get into this leading lured position on the bottom of the racetrack to lead into the pre-start. Minute 15 seconds to go, and that's going to put pressure on Thomas to make a decision. Does he pull the trigger early and try and go for a hook? Robertson will likely defend by squeezing down towards the ley line. Or does he try and roll over the top? And that, that'll give Robertson the option to accelerate and try and pin him. But in these light conditions, you need speed to maneuver these catamarans. And that's just an elusive term as these puffs filter down across the race course. Neither boat moving right now, 48 seconds to go. Great shot of the uh, pirate ship uh, restaurant in the background. And uh, you'll expect to see Robertson put his bow up here and start to accelerate shortly. And what's Thomas going to do? So there's Robertson's Jenica. He starts to accelerate. Has he hooked Thomas? He has. He's sucking up to him, doing a really good job, keeping high. And now Robertson really doing a nice job, but Thomas holding the high ground, able to, able to stay high. 12 seconds. Has Robertson done enough to get up to Thomas? I think he's done well. Now out comes... The Jenica on Thomas, can he get over the top? He had a look, he's trying to roll, but no, it's Phil Robertson, bow forward, bow out. Thompson, uh, Thomas not able to set his Jenica, and it's first blood to Phil Robertson as he accelerates across the starting line towards the first mark. Beautiful job for Phil Robertson and the China One Ningbo team, closing out Stephen Thomas. He was down two to zero to Thomas yesterday. He won one race, and now he is flying a haul into mark number one, leading this final race so far. If he can keep this up, he'll move on. Stephen Thomas looking to get back in the match, but have a look at that breeze, some of the fastest boat speed we've seen this afternoon. And it's Phil Robertson leading into mark one. Well, as long as Robertson's uh, in the lead, he'll be happy to see breeze on the racetrack. Uh, now, now they're going downwind, and you can see the boat really decelerate as Thomas comes flying into the top mark, and now you can expect to see the boats compress quite a bit. Another puff of breeze there. Accelerates Phil Robertson's boat. The breeze this afternoon finally filling in more than we've seen in any of the other matches, and Thomas doesn't seem to have the same speed, the same pressure. As Phil Robertson rounds the leeward gate, Heads up to the left-hand side in the lead. Well, fortunately for uh, Robertson, that um, probably they, they had a big left-hand shift, nice puff that got him down to the leeward gate. So uh, no jibing required. And as Thomas rounds the right-hand gate, he's bow forward on this right side. Is he able to get some pressure and accelerate? No, it's... That's Phil Robertson accelerating, flying a hole. He just seems to be getting those magic puffs when he needs them, Tucker. 
Well, there's a reason Phil Robertson is the current world champion in these M32 catamarans on the tour and winner of every catamaran match race event so far. Also in the Congressional Cup, which you sailed in, Scotty, he finished fourth. And those finishes have him world rank number one in the world for match racing. So it's no surprise he's in the lead as Thomas Tax from the right-hand side looking for an opportunity to catch back up. Oh, Thomas just parks up there in the tax, Scott, as Phil Robertson just keeps his momentum and his boat speed. Here comes Thomas, though, finally getting up to pace. So look at that, Thomas just starting to fly a hole there, and uh, Robertson certainly losing a lot of speed in that tack, but as long as he's able to accelerate, and now he's, uh, now he's looking good, he's approaching the left-hand top mark for the final time, and it looks like Thomas is going to have to tack one more time to go through to the gate. It's... Phil Robertson around the top mark with a healthy lead over Steve Thomas. You know, what's surprising, Scotty, in, in this race compared to the others we've seen today is Phil Robertson has not seemed to park up once, whereas all the other matches, including here, Stephen Thomas, slow in a light spot, luffing up to try and get up around the mark, killing his boat speed. But that just doesn't seem to happen to Phil Robertson. Well... Certainly no question about Robertson's uh, talents, but certainly more breeze on the racetrack now in general than we've had for the previous races. And uh, that'll be making Robertson very happy indeed. Coming from 2-0 down yesterday in wet and wild conditions, uh, now looking uh, very much in control over this match against Steve Thomas. So it Robertson. looks like a very slow drive there from Robertson, but you can see Thomas at the top of the picture going nowhere fast. And uh, again, like you keep saying, Tucker, uh, it looks slow, but Robertson still moving. Yeah, so somehow. important. He always seems to have his boat speed moving and his boat positioned in the best part of the course for the most breeze compared to the others. He also tends to be one of the most relaxed match racing helmsmen on the tour. But you can be sure it is far from relaxing in any of these races on board, or at least in the mind of Phil Robertson. Picking his way through a challenging minefield of puffs here on the Never River in St. Petersburg, and that was the last turning mark before the finish. Phil Robertson's race to lose as he looks to seal the deal over Stephen Thomas. And then there it is again, Scotty. Phil Robertson's private puff takes him right to the finish line, just to windward of the Peter and Paul Fortress here in St. Petersburg. That's the finish line to the far right of the screen, the white and black checkered mark. Great puff on Phil Robertson right now. Just um, smoking down this last reaching leg. And there he is across the finish line. He finally did it. Came from 2-0 down. It's Phil Robertson winning 3-2 over Steve Thomas of Australia. And that seals the China 1 Ningbo team moving on into the quarterfinals. And you can see they're pretty happy about that. Job done. More to come as Match Cup Russia continues. Meanwhile, for Stephen Thomas, it's book a ticket back to Australia. Good effort, though, but Phil Robertson's not a team that's going to roll over easily in any competition. No, not at all, but he certainly did it the hard way, didn't he? he uh, it was the second race yesterday, I believe, where uh, Robertson was in the lead and just had a uh, jive that didn't quite go the way he'd hoped. And uh, so it was Steve Thomas that had got up to an early 2-0 lead, but then uh, Phil Robertson able to uh, claw all three races back to win 3-2. OK, 
Okay, so we've got Phil Robertson down on the water. We're going to hear about how that race went. Phil Robertson, this is Tucker in the commentary booth. Can you hear us? Yeah, I got you, Tucker. Hey, listen, mate, it's obvious for me to say congratulations. A great win. You're through to the quarterfinals. But I've got to be honest, watching you sail, for some reason, every other boat and every other match would find holes on the race course and slow down, but not you guys. You seem to always be up to full pace, always be in the right spot. What do you make of that? What are you guys doing differently? But um, yeah, Stevie put up a pretty good fight, and um, I think a bit of credit to my boys as well for coming back, being 2 0 down to come back and winning that one. So I think we're a bit more relieved than anything, and um, yeah, we've sailed on this river a few times and know what it's like, and speed is definitely your friend, so we're trying to um, keep her in the puffs pretty much as much as we could today. Yeah, hi, Phil. Uh, Scotty here. Nice job, mate. Uh, you seem like you're sailing uh, very relaxed, almost, uh, I wouldn't say nonchalant, but very relaxed. Does, does that help to be relaxed and patient in these conditions? Yeah, it is a key. You've got to be very relaxed and, um, as you say, very patient as well because it's going to be shifty, you're going to get random puffs and you're going to have big losses at times. And to be able to just accept it and keep the boat moving is, is definitely the way forward. So. Yeah, it's definitely something we work on, trying to be as relaxed as possible, and I'm glad it's showing. <laughs> well, well done. Keep up the relaxed work there, Phil. You guys are doing a great job. Good luck in the next match. Nice. Cheers, boys. We're now going to move to the pre-start. We're already in it, actually. Minute 15 seconds to go between Kim Kling and Peter Jan Postma. Dark blue is Kim Kling. Red is Postma. Jibing here. Back for the line ahead of Kling. Scotty, coming up on the one-minute mark. Yep, must, situa uh, must win situation for Kling, and it's Postma in the uh, lead position, and we've seen the boat um, leading back come out on top more often than, than not in, in uh, the recent races. 45 seconds to go, both boats putting their bow up, and Postma keeping his bow forward, seeing if he can keep Kling locked in here, but Kling doing a nice job keeping the boat moving and more importantly keeping his windward gauge. Kling just trying, he's uh, still got his Jenica unfurled. Is he going to be able to take that and accelerate? It's, I, th wow, it looks like mm. Postman might have parked up there. Yeah. Racks in by Kling with only seven seconds to go. He's done a wonderful job. Postma parking up. Two, one. There's the signal. And Kling off to the races, flying a hole. Excellent start by Kling. Was able to stay to windward and look at him ripping off towards the first mark. And I'd expect to see, oh, now, now his boat sits down. It's Postma on the potentially the inside position, but it looks like Kling has rolled him. Excellent start, Tucker. I just wonder if that was an unforced error by Postma. He got a bit parked up with his bow too close to the wind, and he didn't uh, unfurl his Jenniker early enough. Kling unfurled first and just pulled forward, got better speed, better positioning, and by the time Postma accelerated, Kling was off, and there's the lead at Mark 1. Well, uh, small mistakes in conditions like this can be heavily punished, so uh, not sure if it was a mistake by Postma, but... Certainly, good job to Kling and his team for uh, taking advantage of a very tight situation. But now it's Kling parking up, so maybe uh, Postma's turn to, uh, to make a gain. And again, we, we uh, just mentioned it, didn't we, that Phil Robertson's race just seemed to be generally a bit more breeze on the racetrack, and it looks like the uh, river's gone into that light mode again. You can see Postma, his sails, mm. he's going absolutely <laughs> nowhere. The boats were only three boat lengths apart, and yet that was a massive difference in velocity as Kling just slingshotted around the outside. Postma parked dead in the water, trying to jibe, trying to get reconnected, but it's the current that's got him as Kling heads in the lead to mark number two.
Yeah, this is a great shot here. You can see how much current there is. You can see the boats fighting to get down there, but the second they turn, they slingshot upwind, <laughs> and Postma, unfortunately, oh. he was just out of sync with the puff and, uh, and, and on the wrong jibe, and now he's, he's had to jibe again and still battling the current while Kling in the foreground just doing a nice job cruising upwind, and he'll uh, try to make short work of this next beat. Well, that's what he'll need to do to stay in the match, or the regatta, rather, overall. We've now shifted to a first to win two, best of three. The Super 16 qualifying round. So if Kling stays out in front, he'll even the score. Or can PJ Postma catch up and seal the deal in two? There's a little bit of a split, and interestingly, Kling, having tacked on the starboard, sailing without a head soul and still just about to fly a hull. Does that mean that he feels, well, he's got uh, four, three guys on the rack and he's sitting to windward? I mean, um, that's uh, a good indication of the boats changing modes because they think there's enough breeze. And certainly on the right-hand side of the track here, it looks good, doesn't it? Looks a lot better than PJ Postma does here in the foreground. Looking to get into some of that breeze that Kling has. Kling already at the top mark and around. This will be the final run. Can P.J. Postma catch up at this point? Kling will say no. Well, this was a must-win race for Kling, and he's certainly doing that in style at the moment. It's certainly not over, but uh, the further downwind, again, down, down castle, the further away from the winter castle Kling can get, the more comfortable he will be. Uh, downwind means up current, and uh, that's that's incredibly uh, valuable. Um, so uh, that is Postma approaching the the final top mark now, and he's finally got a lot of breeze, but not before Kling gets the same puff and heads comfortably downwind. Hull flying, PJ Postma just rounded. He's in H two. Configuration, both holes in the water. Kling drops down off the, uh, drops his hull back in the water and is sailing, and uh, now it's just flying up again. It's still patchy, Scott. It's still puffy, but overall the breeze is picking up, it seems. It has picked up. It's uh, definitely clocked to the right a little. Uh, that is Kling rounding the, uh, the leeward gate for the final sprint to the finish. Again, the um, Peter Paul Fortress in the background. Wow, that's a great side there. Flying a hole right in front of the commentary tent, smoking along the shoreline. Massive and puff. And that'll take Kim Kling over the finish line to win his first match against PJ Posma and even the score. Next boat that wins between these two, two will move on into the quarterfinals. But well done, Kim Kling from Sweden. You can see how excited they are, Tucker. They've just drawn the scoreline, but uh, obviously excited to still be in, uh, in the competition, and, and why wouldn't they be? So they get one more um, roll of the dice, one more swing at it here. So the next match will be um, against Postma, Kling Postma, one apiece. Next match advances, uh, the winner advances to the next round. We'll see who will join. Phil Robertson, who's already through. Matt Jerwood is through. Peter Jan Postma, Kim Kling, tied. We'll see which one of those two teams will come through as well. And then more sailing this afternoon here on the Neva River in St. Petersburg. Less than one minute to go for the pre-start sequence of the next match. That's likely to be Nico Delacarth and Ian Williams. Williams won the first match. We'll see if Delacarth and Chile Racing can even the score. Matthias Dalstrom with his eyes on the watch. Coming up on the four-minute signal. 
for the next match. Here we go. So there are your two teams. To the right, in green, Nico De La Carte. To the left, in orange, six-time match racing world champion, Ian Williams from Great Britain. I'll tell you one thing, Scotty, I'd be a little bit nervous if I were Nico De La Carte. Six-time world champion, and you're a point down to your opponent in a first to win two. Pressure is definitely on Nico De La Carte. Oh, pressure definitely off, nothing to lose, so uh, might as well come out swinging. It's, um, man, what a, uh, a, again, beautiful racetrack, but uh, quite random so far with the puffs, but one thing we know for sure, the current running very strong up the uh, shoreline here, downtown St. Petersburg. 55 seconds to the entry now, the orange boat of Ian Williams on the screen. You know, it looks very slow and unorganized, but every maneuver before the start has a purpose. Time on distance, positioning, looking at the puffs, taking into account the current, the clock, the Albert Relay clock ticking down, two minutes, 30 seconds to go. Nice watch. They and are nice uh, watches. Beautiful. <laughs> And, uh, and as you're saying, Tucker, they, uh, the boats are you know, very down speed. They look very casual with what they're doing. But because the boats accelerate so quickly, all they have to do is get in a rough position. So here they go, deploying with six seconds to go. And just watch how quickly they accelerate here. Two, one, and there is there we the go. entry signal. Two-minute signal underway. The pre-start between Nico De La Carth and Ian Williams. Here's Williams in orange to windward, looking to have a go. So looks like Williams sailing very deep, trying to change sides with De La Carte here. De La Carte will have to get his jibe in onto starboard to prevent Williams from taking that side. And you can see what Williams did there. He suggested he was going to go that way, and he just forced De La Carte to burn up so much of that runway down to Leward. I hmm. think uh, this is a little different than we've seen in the previous pre-starts. But um, Ian Williams, so many tricks in the bag. Hmm. So it'll, but it, uh, it'll be interesting to see how far he pushes De La Carte this way. I'm so Williams still with his Jenica out, is suggesting he's going to go for a hook here. You just have to wonder how far below ley line they are with only 45 seconds and very light, tricky conditions. De La Carth on top of Ian's breeze, and there's a good puff for Williams. But can he get the hook before they get below ley line? De La Carth has got to be on ley line. 35 seconds to go. There's the yellow pin. There's the hook. Oh, Williams. He's done it at the last second. He knew exactly what he was doing, didn't he? Now he goes head to win, but De La Carth away on port tack now De La Carte accelerates uh oh few little bumps that's going to be a difficult position for Williams yeah. and you can see he's lost steerage hasn't he 10 seconds to go De La Carte takes a step up there's a great shot the boat's bow to bow but who's going to accelerate first I mean Williams could be in trouble can he get his boat up to speed can he get across the line Looks above lay line for the pin or will De La Carte roll over the top Wow, there's the acceleration. I think De La Carte looks like he's got a nice puff there. Almost flying a hull. He, it doesn't really... Yes, he is. So that'll be a big acceleration advantage to De La Carte and Williams having to climb out of that lower corner. And De La Carte, what an excellent start. Mm. Three boat length lead in front of the six-time world champion. Well, you saw how hard Ian Williams fought for that lured position. He got it, but then he ran out of breeze and ran out of momentum. Yep, he had the initiative, and uh, he really uh, chose his poison. And that time, it didn't taste too good. So De La Carte doing a, uh, an exceptional job of uh, 
of um, keeping the risk low there and um, staying clean. I was surprised that Williams didn't elect to try and lead back, but Delacarth closed the door on that option. And now he'll lead around mark number one in a must-win situation, but Williams is right back in this, reeling in Delacarth with speed. And you can see Delacarth put his bow down to go into downwind mode and just uh, the, the action of turning downwind and then having to turn up again because the breeze died at that moment, that really sacrificed uh, a lot of his lead. But now it's Delacarte accelerating away. It is unbelievable how close these boats can be. And one of the boats um, gets the puff and the other one does not. I'm surprised. Williams, you know, that was a tough decision for Williams. Yes. He couldn't really accelerate in the dirt or the dirty air of Delacarte. And then he elected to jibe in a light spot. Will it pay off or has Delacarte accelerated more? Coming into the lured mark, both teams converging. I think Williams has done it here. He's got the puff. He's got the big shift. And he soaks down wow. inside the mark. And absolutely brilliant work by Ian Williams. So Williams has stolen the lead back from Delacarth as we head back upwind and regains control of the match. Wow, excellent teamwork by Ian Williams and Team GAC Pindar in control coming from behind. He jibed at a moment when it seemed like he was dead in the water, but he saw the shift coming. He saw the puff. And now Williams with a firm grip and not letting go. Oh, hang on. I'm wondering if that's a penalty flag on the umpire boat. It is a blue flag. Ian Williams got a penalty at that lured mark, and I wonder if it's because Delacarth may have been into the zone first, and Ooh. Williams went in there. You're the expert, Scotty, so I don't want to take away your thunder. Oh what boy, um, I, that, that's, uh, that, that's all it could be, maybe Tucker, but it looked like uh, Williams was bowed down. Uh, we, we'll, we'll have to have a chat with the umpires. Look at this. This is very entertaining. Yep. Williams has to slow down to get behind Delacarth, but Delacarth is slow and in Williams' breeze, or uh, dirty air rather. Williams is looking at him saying, look, they're talking to each other. I can't slow down and get behind you until you accelerate. And he said, I can't accelerate because you're on my breeze. Yep, the Ian, game Ian Williams having a full-on conversation with the umpires. It's basically, <laughs> guys, what do you want me to do? He cannot slow down until Delacarte speeds up. To wait, the way he has to shed this penalty is go behind his opponent. And look at Williams. They just can't get behind him. So if, <laughs> if you're Delacarte here, what are you waiting for? So I just, now... I don't know what... So Ian Williams sailing away. So did they determine... That he did the penalty, I well, wonder. Did he I give up? Would love two to hear the umpire's take on that. It looks like the flag's down, so it looks like Ian Williams has done his penalty. So De La Carte, uh <laughs> slowed up there, and um, Williams said, "That's that's fine. We're going to sacrifice two boat lengths, and uh, now we're going to go back racing." Thank you very much. Well, there you have it. Yeah, we, uh, it'll be very interesting to uh, talk to the umpires at the end of this race. We'd like to hear what the call was. And then uh, also, um, obviously, they were satisfied that Ian Williams did his penalty, which is to slow up by two bow lengths. Interesting. Orange hull there, that's Ian Williams in the lead. He was uh, behind on the first downwind, but uh, was able to jibe away, get a massive right-hand shift and soak down into the leeward gate. And it looked like uh, Williams had the inside, but uh, came away from the leeward gate with a penalty. So we, we may be able to interview the umpire, Craig Mitchell, after this match. So there's Possibly. Williams around the leeward gate. Yeah, this is going to be a fascinating debrief, isn't it, Tucker? Because <laughs> it, uh, it, it looked like Ian Williams had done everything right, then got penalized, but able to shed his penalty. Uh, the umpires obviously assessed that he had slowed down enough relative to the course to wipe the penalty clean and take the race 
Ian Williams heads for the line, victorious over Nico De La Carth. Now 2-0, that means he'll move on into the quarterfinals of Match Cup Russia. Wow, what a match. Talk about unusual. <laughs> Certainly had its drama, didn't it? There's uh, De La Carte uh, flying along the shoreline, and that'll be his final flyby in this match uh, in the series. Ian Williams takes that uh, interchange two points to zero. So we're going to see if we have a replay of that race and find out what happened at the Leward Mark for sure, and the start, many other areas. Here's the start first, coming into the starting line, Scotty. This is where uh, Williams, the orange boat, goes low for the hook. Yeah, and they were already a long way down in the box, and uh, you saw Ian Williams kept his Jenica up, and um, he was happy to take that Leward position, but then De La Carte did a wonderful job, did a couple of tacks, and across the starting line, got the puff first, and rolled over the top of Williams. You see De La Carte off to the races there, and Williams just clambering to climb out from, from that corner. And then there is the lured mark, and it was Williams that caught a shift downwind, rounded the lured mark on the inside, and we're not too sure. Maybe it was a windward lured there. He had a penalty, and then uh, Williams doing the penalty, and finally across the finish line to take it 2-0. So let's go down to the water now with Ian Williams. Ian, this is Tucker Thompson. Can you hear us out there? Tell us what happened at that lured mark with the penalty. Well, we, we were just discussing it with the umpires. Uh, they had us um, clear a stern at the zone uh, and therefore without room. Uh, funnily enough, we dispute that, but there, there you go. They're, they're the umpires. They make the decisions, and we have to stick with them. And you were slowing down for a very long time. How did you finally shed the penalty? What was going on there? confusion we're slowing down I think maybe he thought the penalty was on him and so he was slowing down as well and eventually the umpires I think lost patience and took it down so uh, not really sure what was going on but uh, we're obviously happy just to, to get through it's pretty tricky out here well done Ian and now you're moving forward in the regatta congratulations yeah, thanks Tucker okay so there we go a little bit of confusion in that penalty no confusion for us, Scotty. We're going to rejoin the action between Jan Guichard and Lukas Wasinski. First to win two matches, and we're already in the pre-start, heading towards the line. And the uh, black boat, I believe, is Jan Guichard. Wasinski. Is that Wasinski that's actually caught a buoy, Scott? Hooked up on one of the exclusion markers and stopped in the water as Guichard takes off towards mark number one. And oh. I can pretty well tell you how that match is gonna go. They're sending a guy in the water on Wasinski's boat to untie the mark and re-rig it. Now they can do that, but they've gotta reattach it. Uh, this is gonna be a while. I wonder if they're actually, they're auto what they're doing. They're removing the uh, lock from the rudder so they can lift it up and dislodge it. So the lead boat there, Gashad, um, nice pressure on the race course, but uh, this race pretty much over and done with his uh, opponent. Oh, nice. <laughs> Just uh, catching the rack on, um, on, on one of the marks there on the course. But uh, yeah, his opponent still in the pre-start area, untying one of the limiting buoys from the rudder. Gashad out to a very large lead. Wonderful view from the Peter Paul That's fortress pretty cool. looking across the river. Now, have a look at Wasinski. He has finally disconnected from that exclusion mark and will head for the starting line well behind. But they still have to finish the race. Although, Scott, I do believe under the rules there's a certain amount of time they have before they cross the line. I think it's a minute. Well, we'll see what happens, but uh, certainly seems I, I, I'm not wearing one of the um, same beautiful watches that Tucker is, but certainly been a minute uh, or more by my clock.
out, out in front, one of the fastest multi-hull sailors in the world, Jan Guichard, his crew right forward, all the way up towards the front near the mast. All but impossible at this stage for Wasinski to catch up, but never say never in sailing, of course. Now, Scotty, here's some interesting news. We're going to hear from the man himself, the umpire that made that call, and also not only the call for the penalty for Ian Williams, but how it was shed. It's Craig Mitchell. Craig, this is Tucker Thompson. Have you got us down there in the water? Yep, I'm here, Tucker. How are you, buddy? Listen, uh, not only were we confused, but Ian Williams admitted to us that they were confused as well. So first tell us what the penalty was for and then what happened there while they were slowing down trying to shed it. Uh, yeah, I think everyone's confused in that one. Um, as they uh, approached the, the left turn gate at the bottom there, uh, we had a call from the wing boat saying that they were uh, Williams' as clear stern. Uh, Williams went into the gap, um, and so we gave them a penalty for taking room to which they were not entitled. Um, and then, so after we displayed the penalty flag, uh, I think there was some confusion on the other boat, and so they slowed down. And both boats slowed down and kept slowing down, so eventually... Uh, as it was intended, and so we uh, took the penalty flag down, and the race continued. So while you're talking, Craig, we're looking at a replay of that. Wasinski slowed down, and so did Williams. Um, when did they finally figure it out? What, what, when did you finally remove the penalty? Uh, we let the penalty stand for about 30 or 40 seconds, I think, um, and then when it was obvious that, um, that uh, the penalty wasn't working out as we thought, we took the penalty flag down. Well, Craig, when the competitors are confused, and even when we're confused up here in the commentary booth, we know one thing, you never are. Thanks for explaining it to us, buddy. Yeah, thanks, Tucker. No worries. So there you have it. Ian Williams was right. I guess Wasinski thought he got the penalty, and so did Williams, and therefore they both hit the brakes. One man who has not hit the brakes in this match is Jan Guichard. Just crossed wrapped up, yeah, line. just crossed the finish line and sealed the deal. That was an easy race all the way around the track and a fast one. Yep, you can see on the graphic there it says leg five of five, and I assure you Wazinski was not on leg five of five, and that was because he hooked one of the uh, limiting marks in the pre-start, and uh, that certainly uh, took away any opportunity for him to even really turn up to that race, to be fair, Tucker, so... He's going to have to shake that one off and, uh, and go again in the next round. Good point. He'll definitely have, uh, have time to shake that off and get back into the next match. Plenty more opportunity. So our next match is going to be Kim Kling and Peter Jan Posma. And remember, Kling won the first match, and Posma, I believe the score is one to one. There it is. So whoever wins this match, Scotty, will go on into the quarterfinals of Match Cup Russia. Albert Relay telling us that we've got three minutes and 30 seconds to go. The orange boat in the foreground with the yellow flag. That's Peter Jan Postma from the Netherlands. And in the background, the blue boat, Kim Kling from Sweden. Both waiting a minute and 15 seconds to go to the pre-start far right of screen just to lure under the Winter Palace here in St. Petersburg, Russia. Once again, if you're just joining us, I'm Tucker Thompson, your host, along with match racing star Scott Dixon from Long Beach, California, all the way to Russia to bring you live action of Match Cup Russia, day number four, Super 16 qualifying round, winding down as these teams look to make the top eight quarterfinals here on the Neva River in St. Petersburg. First time World Match Racing Tour has brought a tour level event to Russia. And what a great choice, St. Petersburg. What a beautiful venue. History in the background as match racing history in the foreground continues. Here's Peter Jan Postma on an upward trajectory, finishing 16th in Australia, finishing fourth at the Match Cup Sweden last month. He won the qualifying round yesterday, and he's got 15 seconds to seal the deal over Kim Kling, who will also want to get a win to move on to the quarterfinals. Scotty, 
the two minute mark coming up. It is Kling to windward. Peter Jan Postman with his Jenniker out to leeward. Here's the two minute signal. So what we've seen so far, Tucker, with the exception of one race, it's all about who controls the, the leeward ground and therefore the ability to accelerate. And uh, I think Ian Williams is uh, possibly the only team that maybe <coughs> took it a little further th than they intended. Um, but it's Kling uh, who has jibed early and uh, trying to force Postma to burn up some of that uh, lured racetrack. 125, game of cat and mouse, neither boat wanting to commit just yet. It's Postma on the right in the orange boat, Kling in the blue boat. If you're just joining us, it's relatively light conditions. We are sailing downtown St. Petersburg and the current is ripping here. So it's, uh, again, if you can prevent the other boat from accelerating, it really does a lot of damage. So it's Kling, has he got the hook in to lure there? So this is similar to what we saw in the last race between uh, Williams and his opponent. In that last race, Williams got shot out, out of the back off the starting line and then was able to get back into the match. I think that's cling and control there, isn't it? Forcing his opponent to tack. So that's going to be an expensive maneuver for Postma. Oh, that's interesting. And they're that far above the line that he, you that he thought had to he, jive around. Yeah, that is yeah, interesting. Yeah, you would have thought he would have tacked back for the line, but he's jived. I guess he just figured that jiving was a less expensive maneuver than uh, tacking twice. Let's see how it works out for him. Two, one, and wow. excellent. And there it is. <laughs> That's why he did it. Great start to Postma. L he looked like he was in a very dire position with about 15 seconds to go, but got the puff, put the bow down, and accelerates away to an early lead over Kling. Wow, talk about a get out of jail free card. Kling had him just up against the ropes and what should have been an expensive maneuver, the jibe, turned into a win across the starting line. Now Kling getting right back into it with a puff of breeze. Both boats almost bow to bow into mark number one, but it's going to be Postman to the inside in control and now just sliding forward in the lead. Wow, that's close, isn't it? And it looks like Postma is in control and he's got nice breeze, but we've seen the boats park up on this downwind leg. This is downwind and battling the current, so any time the lead boat go, uh, gets light on pressure, it uh, gives the trailing boat a lot more options. But Postma doing a good job. <coughs> so there you see the... the Lead really getting cobbled up by Kling coming from the stern. It's Postma rounding the left mark. Kling electing to jibe one more time. So he'll have some nice leverage on this right-hand side of the racetrack. And Postma tacking immediately to stay with Kling and connect with the same amount of pressure or breeze that Kling has. Kling, however, slingshots forward with a right-hand puff. That's going to help him out as Postma looks to stay connected in the same breeze to keep his speed up. So this will be interesting. You can see Kling there flying a hull and really turning his speed into, into height and closing the gauge. Now he rolls into attack. That was a little bit of a late uh, furl, wasn't it? Hmm. Uh, but oh, Look at Postma just hit the brakes. Yep. Sailed right into a big low. Kling on starboard, Postma on port. Is Postma going to cross? I don't know. Kling starting to accelerate. This is going to be close. No, and there's the duck. And so it's lead change. It's Kling in the lead, flying a hole, Postma ducking. Very challenging conditions for both teams. Nothing in it. Neck and neck between both of them. One to one. Whoever wins this match moves on. Postma attacks to follow Kling up win. So now Kling parking up a little, and Postma in the windward right-hand spot. Yeah, both boats looking very light, aren't they? Frustratingly light if you're PJ Postman. I think Kling has got it. 
Just as I say that, though, big puff of breeze for the Dutch team. And now it could be bow to bow again. Starboard tack advantage under the rules will go to PJ Postma. Yeah, that was looking good for Postma there, but unfortunately it was a left-hand shift, but look at how he's closed up. He can't go in there because that's Kling's mark to own, and Kling tacks and really parks up. Is Postma going to be able to cruise around the top? He thinks he can. He's putting his bow down. Lead oh. change, and he's that's Kling lost there. So another lead change. It's Postma over the top. Fills his Jenica. What a move oh, by P.J. No. Postma. Kling had the inside. He went to tack and then Luff. P.J. Postma up. Postma had enough momentum to go all the way around the top. And then Kling got stuck, lost steerage, and is only now re-accelerating four to five lengths behind P.J. Postma, who heads downwind out in front. Uh, it just goes to show, Tucker, that uh, you know every maneuver in these boats in this condition is so expensive. And uh, Kling was doing a great job and um, maybe just uh, got a little too aggressive and was trying to uh, was trying to luff maybe um, Postma there when um, really just uh, getting the bow down and keeping moving might have been a better option but great uh, great judgment and crew work by Postma and his team Postma having jibed for the leeward gate the final turn there it is for the sprint to the finish. He definitely had to fight for it. There's Kling in the background in blue, hasn't even jived yet for the mark. And Postma has definitely earned this victory. He'll roll up the Jenniker comfortably, heading for the finish line out in front and to windward of the Peter and Paul Fortress here in St. Petersburg. Yeah, so furling up the uh, Jenniker nice and early. That's just an indication that there is enough pressure and the breeze I think has clocked right. So uh, nice Postma will be very happy with that result indeed, won't he? But man, it came down to that last windward mark. There he goes across the finish line to take a 2-1. It's PJ Postma over Kling. And um, Tucker, that'll can't, I can't wait to uh, speak with him in the interview because that really was decided at that last interchange at the windward mark. And it could have gone either way. And there's Kling, frustratingly knowing that his Match Cup Russia is over. We're going to go look at the replay now and see where it all went down. Kling was ahead. Here it is. So this is the uh, on the beat, and it's Postma ducking. So uh, Kling taking the lead and now accelerates away. Yeah, so there was still a lot of racetrack to go here, and this is the critical moment, and it was Postma coming in on starboard. Uh, he was able to keep his windward gauge and a little bit of steerage mm. and just cruised around the top, and in fact, rolling Kling there prevented Kling from accelerating at all. And finally, it was an easy uh, victory on the final leg, but all the damage done at that final windward mark. Great job to PJ Postma and his team. I'm sure PJ's quite happy with that. He'll move on in Match Cup Russia. Now we'll move on to the pre-start. Less than three minutes to go, 2.22 to be exact. Our next match in orange and green will be Mons Holmberg. He'll be in orange against Viktor Sereskin in green. Two minutes coming up. Green to windward. Sereskin will enter above the committee boat. Orange to leeward will be Mons Holmberg. And this, the first to win two matches, and that's the two-minute signal. Well, I have to say, Tucker, it's uh, nice to see uh, the racing getting in. The uh, race committee, in fact, the, the whole organization here have been working very hard to uh, make the most of challenging conditions, both yesterday because we had uh, too much breeze, and then uh, today it took a while to um, get things rolling. It was a light shifty wind and, and a very constricted area here in downtown St. Petersburg. But uh, finally, everybody's uh, efforts are being paid off with some fantastic racing uh, lead changes. And it's, uh, it's very exciting stuff. In the pre-start, we've got Sereskin and Holmberg, 109 to go. 
and uh, it's the green boat. Sereskin uh, taking the lured ground, putting his bow up. And again, just a reminder that the current is absolutely ripping here. So basically when the boats put their bow up and slow down, they, they uh, slow up uh, relative to uh, advancing towards the starting line very quickly. Mons Holmberg going for the hook, trying to get overlapped with Victor Sedieskin and pin him away from the line. Sedieskin slowing down but not allowing the overlap to take place. 30 seconds to go. Sedieskin is early. He'll roll up his Jenniker. Just checking his watch there. He's got to kill some time. When he puts his bow down, Holmberg will try to go for one final hook. Can he do it? So it's all about time and distance judgment here. Who's going to get it? It's the windward boat keeping a little more speed on, but is he going to be able to convert that into a bow forward position? Down, down come the bow, and across the starting line they go, and it's the windward boat, the green boat. Sarah Eskin looks like a good start, sheeting on, and is he forward enough? Yes. Oh, boy, I, it's really too close to tell. No, it's, oh, it's Holmberg to Lewis. Said Eskin was over the line early. He's going to have to what slow it down. Was. So he's giving up his distance now, slowing down to go behind his opponent. That's a shame because it looked like good execution, but it just shows how close you have to push it to, uh, to get the result they're looking for. Wow. So Mons Holmberg slips forward and takes the lead. He'll say thank you very much. The unforced error from Sarah Eskin. Has him out in front at mark one. So there they really couldn't have been much in that, Tucker. I mean, uh, I know if you're over the line by, by an inch, it's as good as a mile. But, uh, boy, both boats looked pretty even. But it was uh, serious. Can, um, being penalized, OCS, so had to um, slow down, go behind his opponent. And uh, now we're looking at Sirieskin, looking very light on the run. In the meantime, it's Holmberg around the Lured Gate with a nice, comfortable lead. Man, right. he just uh, pulled that out of nothing, didn't he? Again, the, the boats, um, I cannot emphasize enough. We've seen it so many times today. The boats so close together uh, on the downwind leg. Uh, separated by only a few meters, mm. and then uh, just seems that the lead boat gets a puff that the the boat right next to them just doesn't seem to get, and it's you know I, I call them helicopter puffs where they uh, come down with a vertical aspect to them, and you know just because uh, one boat gets it doesn't mean they both will. Speaking of that, Seti Eskin had his own little puff and has closed gauge quite a bit after Holmberg tacked. Holmberg's still looking to get up to full speed. It looks as though he's only just starting to now. And Sadieskin has stayed in breeze on this right-hand side of the race course. He'll now tack at the exclusion zone and lose speed as we do in the tacks. And now they're even as far as tacks are considered. So there's the difference. Sadieskin may have reeled Holmberg back in, but Holmberg returned the favor by accelerating again. He'll have one more tack to do into the top marks. And here it comes. Certainly looking at that last shot, Tucker, it looked like uh, more pressure on Sarah Eskin's boat, but this is uh, what we saw in that last um, race. Just the, uh, the pressure seems to be a little bit on the left at the top. So it's Holmberg around the, uh, the windward gate. And in uh, and, and good shape and good pressure. I'd expect to see a fairly early jibe here just to uh, go cover his opponent. And here comes the jibe. Just as you say, Scotty, Holmberg jibes to stay with Sardieskin. Stay between your man and the next mark, the rule in match racing. But Sardieskin has a big puff of breeze on the left-hand side, and Holmberg is parked dead in the water. He's slow. Can Sardieskin roll around the outside and regain the lead? It really is the river of changing fortunes today, isn't it? And, wow. uh, Look at that. Man, that tells a story, doesn't it? The, the camera angles can be deceptive, but I guarantee it was um, 
Siri Eskin that uh, that had a big lead, and I, uh, now it's Holmberg's. Sorry, it was uh, Holmberg that had the big lead. Siri Eskin uh, looked really good downwind. Now Holmberg accelerating. Has Siri Eskin done enough to cut him off at the at the last gate? He There's has. The answer. Oh boy. So great work by Siri Eskin, just uh, getting a puff out of nowhere downwind. And this is the uh, the final reach to the finish. Representing St. Petersburg and Gazprom, Russia's sailing hero, Victor Sereskin, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat, coming from behind against Mons Holmberg to take the first match here in the Super 16 qualifying round over Mons Holmberg. Wow. Never say die in these matches, Scotty. It's not over till the very end. Who saw that coming? Not necessarily Mons Holmberg. No, not at all. And certainly not after the start. It was uh, both boats teeing up and they, they, they looked good with their approach. But it was uh, Siri Eskin who was judged to be uh, over the line early and had to drop back and uh, concede his lead. Um, so it was Holmberg that controlled the next section of the race, but um, Siri Eskin picking up a beautiful, beautiful puff on that last downwind and uh, converting that into the victory. Well done. You have to wonder if um, Siri Eskin saw that puff. By being the lead boat, Holmberg could have chosen to go left or right at the top gate. And I believe it, mostly his choice, giving Siri Eskin the option to go to the other mark, basically sealed his fate against the Russian team as he'll go down 0-1 to one to Sereskin. Good shot of the Winter Palace there here in St. Petersburg. So let's relive that moment, Scotty, where it all went down. Fortunes changed in the last match. Here's the replay on the right-hand side. There's Holmberg in the lead. So this is where it happened on the last downwind. It was Holmberg leading, but you can see he jived and really had no pressure. All Siri Eskin had to do here was go straight. And you can see in the frame there, Siri Eskin on the left, cruising downwind, doing maybe four or five knots, but Holmberg absolutely parked up. And that's a, that was an absolute heartbreaking moment for him because he had a sizable lead. Holmberg only now just starting to accelerate, but you can see how that puff was, um, you know, it was quite a big puff and he started flying a hole, but by then it was too little too late. The damage was already done and there was a big shift with it. And Siri Eskin coming into the foreground, rounds the Leward Gate in the lead and uh, boy, he took a an 80 meter deficit and turned that into a, uh, 50 meter, meter lead, lead. <laughs> so uh, well done to the local team, Siri Eskin. That'll be a popular result. Fascinating race to watch. And the local crowd will certainly be happy with that. Our next batch is going to be Jan Guichard, Lucas Wasinski. And the score between those two, it's currently Guichard one up over Wasinski who hooked a mark in the last match, and I bet you a lot of money, Scotty, he will not make that error again. As we prepare to enter the pre-start, the two-minute signal coming up. Matthias Dahlstrom, PRO. Up, oh, hang on, there's a postponement. We're under delay. So we're gonna be under a delay, Scott. Not sure how long. Maybe we can get you to interview Matthias Dahlstrom and find out what the postponement was for. Either way, racing will resume momentarily between Gishard and Wasinski. And again, if you're just joining us, I'm Tucker Thompson along with Scott Dixon. Day number four of Match Cup Russia here in St. Petersburg continues.
under postponement, waiting for the pre-start between Jan Guichard and Lukas Wasinski. So we're in a uh, postponement. I think it was because the, the umpire boats weren't on the water. And if, uh, if uh, Simon Shaw's listening around the world, it's probably because his friend Craig Mitchell was asleep at the watch. <laughs> That's an inside joke. So we're waiting to hear from Matthias Dahlstrom when we'll go into the pre-start and get underway in racing. So while we're uh, looking at the committee boat with the postponement flag up, we're just going to have a recap on the scores. Beautiful backdrop of downtown St. Petersburg. So up the top of our screen, that was the... Um, yeah, yeah, it was Jan Gouchard, 1-0 up over Lukas Wazinski. Uh, the uh, the next match, it was Postma who came from behind in the deciding race to go up 2-1 over Kim Kling. And next up, Ian Williams, 2-0 over Nico Del Delcart. And the result from yesterday, it was Matt Jerwood in the very blustery conditions, 3-0 over Sally Barco and Team Magenta. So the match is out on the water right now. It's uh, Seriezkin came from behind again on that final downwind. That was the last match we saw over Mans Holmberg. Darkhammer and Wara have yet to race. Steve Thomas down two. It was uh, two races each against Phil Robertson. Phil Robertson finally winning the deciding race. And then Edegran and Gilmore yet to race. And just a uh, recap, it was um, Robertson that won 3-0 over uh, Steve Thomas, but all the other matches, that was first to three points, all the other matches are first to two points. We've lost considerable time due to... Uh, too much win yesterday and um, perhaps too little this morning. But uh, the race committee and in fact the entire race organization doing a great team of keeping the racing back on track with a slightly shortened format. Next matchup will be Jan Gouchard over Wazinski. Gouchard currently 1-0 up. bit of a gimme race with Wasinski hooking the mark. All Guichard had to do was sail on and take the match. So this will effectively be the first real match between the two teams, even though Guichard already has a win. That's Guichard in black from France. Poland's Lukas Wasinski is in light blue. So it looks like uh, the sun might be threatening, threatening to come out here. Tucker, you'll uh, start to see some of these beautiful golden spires around the um, city really starting, to, <laughs> really starting to shine. Twenty seconds coming up. What a great! The Albert drop. Relay pre-start clock counting down. To the two-minute signal to windward on the left of screen, the black boat of Yangi Shard. 
one of the fastest multi-hull sailors in the world. Right of screen in light blue is Bosinski. And now both boats entering. Here's two minutes. Well, maybe now with a little more breeze, Tucker, look at that flying a hull into the pre-start, Gushada in the black boat. Maybe we'll start to see um, some uh, slightly more um, standard pre-starts, shall I say. We've, we've had a few with uh, down speed and losing steerage and hook and marks and all the stuff that comes with lighter conditions. But uh, beautiful breeze on the racetrack right now. Minute 30 seconds to go. Guichard leading to the right and heading down for the jibe. Wisinski, Wisinski rather, will have to decide as he closes gauge whether he wants to roll over the top of Guichard or go down the leeward for the hook. So the uh, decision tree here relies heavily on how much breeze they have at the time, what they think is coming. And Wazinski uh, jiving onto port there, taking a step down, if I'm seeing that correctly. And now coming in with speed. Has he been able to get the hook? The blue boat looking faster, but the black boat getting the puff and then rolling back down over the top, defending the low, the low land. So the black boat, Jan Gushard, in the foreground. Great control, both boats bow to bow, 22 seconds to go. And it looks like Gushard in firm control here. I think he's in a perfect position here to pull the trigger when he wants. Wazinski, Wazinski trying to go over the top there. Yeah, I think so, five seconds to go. Is he early or will he be perfectly no. timed? Far enough to windward, put the bows down. One second to go, and they're off wow. to the races. Much better start by Wazinski this All time. Clear. All clear, and he's racing and rolling over the top. I think he might be, and that's a much, much better result than the, than the last start for Wazinski. Beautiful job. Wazinski's done what he's needed to do to return the favor of the loss of the last match, and now he's two boat lengths in the lead and counting over multi-hole master Jan Guichard. And still extending away, isn't he, Tucker? He stayed flying a hole there a little longer while he was on, uh, on top of Guichard's breeze. But now they turn onto the downwind, that first downwind leg where it just seems to Look get at Guichard, so though. tricky. Yeah, exactly. Reeling him back in. It always looks worse than it, than it is because the, the lead boat turns downwind and decelerates first, that always brings the trailing boat in a little closer. Leg two of five, it's the lead boat of Wazinski jibing for the leeward gate. You know, with this course so compressed, Scotty, so short in this southwesterly direction, it really puts a premium on the start. It really does, and uh, we've seen the lead boats, uh, you know, really control the you know, the, the first couple of legs, but the, the races, again, the, the area is just so confined, restricted, it's, it's, it's tricky. There's a lot of current, a lot of holes in the wind, and uh, a little leverage goes a long way on this racetrack. Young Guichard to the far left-hand side yeah, with it was, no Jenniker. It was interesting there, Tucker. They both actually rounded the Lewitt Gate at the same time, and that was because Guichard did not have to <coughs> jibe downwind. So let's see how they are now. It is the blue boat of, it's Gashard. Oh, sorry, Wazinski in the foreground in the light blue boat. Well, he's crossed ahead, but look at Gishard's speed. Yeah. So, yeah, Wazinski heading off to the left, and he's just getting lighter and lighter over there, isn't he? So this is where the boats really, it's, it's wow. so tactical. A Look little puff like that, you can just convert into speed so quickly, but it's, it's all about the last puff that counts. We've seen that in so many races today. Now Wazinski tacks back onto port. He's dead in the water. He is. And, and now Gashad coming out of the starboard, uh, out of the right-hand side of the racetrack. Wazinski accelerating, 
But it looks like Rashad, um, sorry, Rashad's made a big gain here, Tucker. He this has. is going to be close. He has, and under the rules, he'll have rights on starboard tack. Will that force Wasinski? Yes, to tack away. We could have a lead change right here. As Yangi Shard passes Wasinski, rolls over the top, and takes the lead. Impressive performance. And there we go. That's the, uh, that's the difference between in the puff and not being in the puff. So it's Gashard over the top. He gains the lead, but still a lot of work here to do. So Wasinski still in a reasonably good position if he can get the boat going. He jibes away, and um, we saw this work earlier uh, by Ian Williams and his team. So Gashard in the lead, but where is the next puff coming from? Gashard jiving to lure it. He's, uh, I think he's done a nice job. You can still see the boat moving nicely through the water. One more turn to go. Who's going to be ahead at the bottom of the track? Has Gashard still got it? It looks like yes. He does. That's the final turning mark for the Spindrift Racing Team. Oh boy, he turned wow. that into a big lead, didn't he? So coming into the top mark, it was uh, Wazinski approached the gate and he was probably five boat lengths ahead, but Gashar just came trucking out of the right, uh, up and over the top and just kept the boat moving. And look at that, uh, look at that lead now. There he Beautiful goes. port tack along the reach uh, in front of the Peter and Paul Fortress. A couple of boys on the rack making it look easy. What a great sight. And that's a big win because Guichard knows he'll go on to the quarterfinals here of Match Cup Russia. And Wasinski will not. Wow. wow, heartbreak for uh, Wazinski, huh? Just um, was doing everything by the book, but just could not accelerate uh, with that last maneuver. Well, Scotty, let's have a quick look at the replay and see how it all went down for Jan Gishard. Take us through it. Well, here, was, here it was. It was, I uh, believe, that was the last tack there. And Wazinski trying to get the boat going, but Wazard had set this up so far back. He had the speed, had the momentum, kept the boat rolling, and uh, did a nice job there of keeping the boat moving. And in the end, that's a uh, shot of the finished leg. What a beautiful backdrop. Gashard making it look so simple across the finish line to go up 1-0 over Wazinski. 2-0? 2-0, beg your pardon. Guichard, there is a man in multi hulls you would not want to match up against. Two. So let's go down in the water and hear from the man himself, Jan Guichard, who won that match. Hello, Jan. This is Tucker Thompson. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, yes. Great job in that race. I got to be honest with you, I didn't see that coming. Did you? How did you come from behind and pass Wasinski? Yeah, it was a tight match. Uh, we are happy to come back to from behind and we decided to, to swap at the downwind gate. So we take the right mark and it was the right choice uh, because at the top mark we were starboard on the West Port and uh, it was the, the key of the, this match. And you're holding on to a penalty flag there that is obviously out. Was there a penalty on that? Uh, on this race, no, no penalty, no. So I just it. meant the protest flag there in your hand. Did you uh, did you flag that at all at the top? Uh, yeah, we protest, but uh, it was a green flag uh, just uh, in, during the press start. Well, either way, that was a very well-earned uh, win. And I've been saying in the broadcast, I would be very nervous to ever have to come up against you in a multi-hole match race. Congratulations, you're moving on in Match Cup Russia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Right, Scotty? You wouldn't want to sail against Yanki Shard, would you? Well, Given uh, the choice? Not, not, not at all. You, you say he's a multi-hole expert, and um, I am a, I'm a, one of these guys <laughs> that races, uh, <laughs> what, what do they call it these days? Um, half cats. Dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Leaners, <laughs> half cats. They're not even mono holes anymore. They're just half a catamaran. <laughs> the future of sailing here, in certainly in the World Match Racing Tour, 
is multi-hulls in the M32 catamaran revolutionizing the game. Brought to you by Aston Herald from Sweden. Once again, I'm Tucker Thompson along with Scott Dixon and we are moving on in the Super 16 qualifying round. It's now a first to win two best of three series. This is our next match. Jonas Warr and Nicholas Dockheimer. The pre-start coming up in about 50 seconds. And it's going to be Dak Hammer to Leward in the yellow flag, entering below the signal boat. Jonas Warrer to Windward with the blue flag. Dak Hammer in the blue boat. Sorry, that's Warrer in the blue boat. That's tough to tell. We've got yellow on a red boat and blue on a blue boat. But that's a yellow flag on a blue boat, as far as I can see. Who said sailing was complicated, Scotty? Need and um, <laughs> throw the um, <laughs> Swedish flag in there, which is blue and yellow. We can understand the confusion. Well, at least we know where we are. St. Petersburg, Russia. <laughs> <laughs> now that they gave us a window. And yeah. we have the time correct. Two minutes to go. We are very reactionary announcers. <laughs> we can tell you exactly what has happened after it's happened. <laughs> One minute, 45 seconds to go. Both boats on port, heading, heading to the lower right-hand side of the start box. Nicholas Dackhammer in dark blue. Jonas Warrer in red. Dackhammer, two jibes. Warrer launching the spinnaker. He's going for the hook. Dak Hammer's got his eyes on him. Just fishtailing there, slowing the boat down, but not too much. He doesn't want an overlap to occur from behind. And now Warrer will luff up to windward of Dak Hammer. Slow maneuvering here, Scotty. The breeze has dropped in the pre-start. Yeah, this is uh, real cat and mouse stuff. And he rolled over the top there, didn't he? Kept his windward gauge and you can see the breeze is really lightened off and um, it's all about pulling the trigger on the acceleration here I would say advantage and uh, initiative to the uh, orange boat on the right at the moment water although blue boat accelerating <laughs> remember we're reactionary Scotty can't predict Captain Obvious and Lieutenant, that just happened. That's right, Master of the Obvious here. Here we go, 10 seconds. And it looks as though Dackhammer in blue is going to win the start if he's not too early. Puts the bow down. One, here's the gun. Wow, beautiful job. Nicholas Dackhammer. Essex Racing Team over Aarhus Innovator, Jonas Warr. And really not much in that one. It's uh, Dackhammer to Winwood was able to roll over the top, but uh, yeah, Warrod still staying in the action there. We've seen a lot of lead changes this afternoon, and you called it in the very first start of the first race, Scotty, that we're likely to see it in these patchy minefield conditions here in the Neva River in St. Petersburg. No lead is big enough, but you'd be happy to be out in front if you were Nicholas Dackheimer. Three and a half lengths advantage over Jonas Warr. Well, it hasn't just been lead changes, has it, Tucker? It's been races turned absolutely on their head. So it hasn't been a you know, little gain, a little nibble, a little bite. It's been uh, just breeze shutting off and the you know puff coming in from the other direction. So uh, the lead boat, you, you can do everything correct and get four out of shifts right. But... Um, We've seen today it's been that uh, that fifth, fifth shift that uh, decides the race. So to put it differently, you might get four out of five shifts wrong and still be in a position to win. That camera angle there shows Warrer with a bit of speed. Now he's jived to follow Dockhammer into the lured gates. 
Given the choice, most of the leaders have chosen the right-hand side on the lower part of the upwind leg, and that's exactly where Dackheimer heads now. So I think that's uh, Wara in the lead there. We're just uh, confirming the identity of the teams we're uh, looking at. I believe that's Wara heading off to the right. Going for the Jenica Furl. And it's interesting, we've seen a few different techniques being used in the tax today. That one, the... Uh, that one, Dak Hammer, seemed to... That one, uh, Dak Hammer seemed to uh, to unfurl, maybe a little prematurely, but um, got the acceleration. Now Look it's Warwick this. coming out from the left, yeah, trying to hold no pace. Jenica. Team on the rack. Massive acceleration there. And we've got attack from the lead boat, Dak Hammer. Nope, just nope, a luff up slowly, getting around the top mark. But the trailing boat has more speed. Can he convert that? Oh, but he's got attack to make the top mark. So Warrer will slow down and Dockheimer will speed up as he heads downwind. Look, it looked for a moment there, Scotty, like Warrer's door was about to open and he was going to try and step back into this match. Yeah, it really did. And it just shows you how far ahead these teams have to plan their maneuvers and really plan the leg before they get on it. And... Uh, Look at this, though. That's uh, Wara around the top mark and into an immediate jibe. And is he close enough to get on Dak Hammer's breeze? I'll it's showing Dak Hammer's lead boat, but uh, Wara starting to accelerate now. The momentum is with the trailing boat. Wara is making a fight for the front. Has now, he got War enough? Yeah, Wara flying a hold downwind, certainly moving forward. But now comes that all-expensive maneuver, the jibe. So he's not going to get a piece, but maybe he will be able to accelerate first. Jack Hammer has to jibe oh as well. Boy. That slows him down. Look at this. Warra is going to lure it for the hook. Warra trying to stay stay up and uh, and keep the boat going. But that was uh, mm. a well-executed maneuver by Dak Hammer. He, he, he really threw the boat in front of his uh, opponent. Warra tried to get an overlap in at the zone there. But he was able to accelerate and prevent the hook. Absolutely unbelievable wow. boat handling. This is the closest race we've seen yet around the lured mark. Honestly, it's Dak Hammer in the lead, but nothing in it. Dak Hammer has had better positionally, but Warra has been better speed-wise around the track. That makes very close racing between both of these teams. Look at Warra again, the trailing boat. Much faster, flying a hull, reeling in Dak Hammer, but it's going to be too little too late. In front of the Peter and Paul Fortress, the first match goes to Nicholas, Dak Hammer, and crew. But it wasn't easy. Well, there they go across the finish line and uh, furling the Jenica. And yeah, they certainly uh, congratulate each other on a, on a hard fought race. The closest race we've seen so far around the, the last gate and onto the reaching leg. And um, boy, uh, just shows uh, how, how tricky this race course can be. And that was a, uh, I hope we get the replay on that last Nicholas Dackhammer jibe, because that was absolutely superb positioning, acceleration, was able to defend the hook and uh, hang on to control the match. We are now on the pre-start of Holmberg versus Sarinsky. Uh, sorry. Sariyskin. Sariyskin. In green. And Holmberg to windward in orange. Both boats have entered in the pre-start box. Minute 35 to go. So Sariyskin has jibed first and set himself up in a lead position and then slowed down. Now, Holmberg, 
has gone down to leeward. Just waiting for his moment to accelerate into the hook. But not if Sardieskin keeps the overlap from occurring and pulls down farther towards the lay line to the pin, which he has done. And now has he, has he hooked enough to luff up Holmberg, or will Holmberg roll over his bow? I think uh, Holmberg did a wonderful job there of putting his bow up early and rolling over the top. And um, Terry Eskin just uh, a little late in um, furling his Jenica. 35 seconds to go. Both boats close down at that pin lay line at the bottom leeward end of the start. Split tax now, Sedieskin on starboard. And he'll do the same move that PJ Postman did, jiving away at 20 seconds. And a yellow flag has just occurred, so there's a penalty to Sedieskin. Yeah, I'm not sure what uh, that might have been, Tucker, but uh, perhaps a boundary penalty? Not too sure. Well, here comes the start. Mons Holmberg. Jenniker out, crossing the line now. Sedieskin jibed to get away from. Holmberg and get back to the line, but he lost a valuable boat length and a half doing it. Now he's getting up to speed, though. It almost looks like there's a better puff. But is speed helpful to him at this point when he's carrying a penalty? He has no. to slow down. He's got to go behind Mons Holmberg before the next mark. And now I think he has just there. Is the penalty flag still up? I don't think it so. It looks like it's gone down. So now <laughs> Sir Eskin in a uh, very strong position. He's going to have to climb out of Holmberg's gas, but uh, still a very close race. Sir Eskin looked as though he could pop in there and keep the overlap going, but not before, as you say, Scotty. The gas from Holmberg's sails slowed him down, and Holmberg is out in front at Mark 1. Nice sailing, Holmberg, and... Uh, that's about the uh, the longest flight time we've seen uh, flying a hull around the windward mark, carrying it on to that next downwind leg. And right into a jibe for Mons Holmberg. Zeddy <laughs> Eskin will continue on starboard away from Holmberg, splitting on the downwind run, looking for more breeze to that side and getting up current. But... Holmberg is on ley line, slows down a little bit to go bow down and make it around the leeward gate. He's done it, and he'll head to the right-hand side in the lead. Looks like better breeze to that side on the race course. Yes, it does. Between Holmberg and that white boat in the background. And here comes Seti Eskin with a massive amount of speed, flying a haul around the leeward mark and following Holmberg upwind. So we saw some of the boats uh, a little bit earlier, Tucker, sailing upwind with, um, with no Jennikers, which is what they do when they're powered up enough. But uh, clearly the breeze has dropped back down again. Oh, and look at the current. They've... Uh, literally tacked right in front of our commentary booth here and you just see both boats going sideways or starting to disappear up river and it's Holmberg in the lead but Sarah Eskin uh, only I mean it, it, it doesn't look great from this perspective but realistically in, in context of today's race course he is one manoeuvre behind which is nothing so again, you can see it there, Sarah Eskin with good speed, and uh, Holmberg not that far away, but now it's Holmberg's turn to accelerate a little more as Sarah Eskin goes a bit soft. Such difficult conditions. And now, Sarah Eskin, all the time to my ear, Sarah Eskin seems to have better speed. But uh, what Holmberg did there, I think he's just shooting to, uh, to make the, uh, the top mark. A stop-go penalty, I'm not sure. On Holmberg. So Holmberg. Has he gone outside the uh, boundary? There's the penalty for Holmberg. This could open the door for Sergei Eskin. Now the penalty has not gone down yet, but Holmberg is back up to full speed. 
And penalty clear, there it is. I'm not sure, Scotty, what that was. I think he may have just gone outside the, the boundary. He, he must have. That's the only thing it could have been because the boats certainly weren't that close together. And he still has a reasonable lead. But he hasn't really accelerated too much. So let's see what happens with Siri Eskin here. So Holmberg pretty light there. If Siri Eskin um, can uh, get a puff, and he has got a puff. Mm. Uh -oh. Watch when he puts his bow down here. Oh, my goodness. So uh -oh. watch for a lead change here. Siri Eskin couldn't get down to him on star, but I wonder if he might have jived inside there. Tucker. I'm just listening to the umpire radio, sorry. It was a boundary penalty to both of them, but because Blue gained an advantage over Green from doing so, they were the one whose penalty remained outstanding. Okay. Wow, well, so. that got really close. Sergei Eskin had his moment to pass, and I'm impressed that Holmberg Got that very slow jive in, down speed, and then got his bow into some breeze and has managed to hold on to the lead here as we head downwind on the final run. So we're uh, getting into that... Uh, Hello. Wait, we're getting into that um, fifth shift um, scenario where we were saying you, uh, it's, you might get four out of sh five shifts correct or puffs correct, but... Man, it's all about the last one, and right now it's Siri Eskin coming in on port, and it's Holmberg on starboard, but very, very slow. Is Siri Eskin going to be able to get across his bow and jibe down into the zone? He's certainly a lot faster. He is a lot faster. Now he's carving down. I don't think it was before Holmberg no. got into the zone, but he is close enough. He'll have to round behind, but can he pass? Holmberg. Or can he go inside, Scotty? Look at that. He's going to try. Well, he's gone in collision. there. There's a collision. Oh, there's definitely a penalty there. And that there. was Siri onto Holmberg's uh, rack. That's and penalty. Double yellow. Yellow. Well, there's one yellow flag. I don't know where the other one is, but there's definitely one yellow. So on that was Siri Eskin. He made a huge gain, and we, as we suspected, he was not entitled to go inside there, but he did anyway. I think he saw that as his, as his only opportunity to uh, change the result of the race. But it's Siri Eskin coming away with the penalty, so he's going to have to uh, slow up here and go behind Holmberg, and this is the final reaching leg. So pretty much all done and dusted here. Wow. Siri Eskin. Almost back in the match. Live by the sword, die by the sword. And he copped a penalty when he saw his moment. Now he's, he's re-hoisted, but the penalty hasn't been shed yet because he's got to be clear behind. Now I believe he is for sure. There he goes. Bow down. Heading for the line, but the race goes to Mons Holmberg. So across the finish line, there he is. Mans Holmberg, and uh, again, coming down to that last lured mark. Uh, I'm going to call this the, the river of changing fortunes. I'm not sure what the meaning is in Russian, but that's my rough Kiwi translation for today, at least. That was a nail-biting race to watch. Let's go back and replay how it went down, Scotty, right from the start. So here it is Our coming mark, into sorry. the last lured gate, and you can see uh, Holmberg was clear ahead going into the zone, and uh, really, Siri Eskin, oh, I, wow. I, 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 I'm not sure what he was thinking, but um, clearly uh, Some green paint created the boat. overlap, created more than an overlap, uh, too close to the mark, within a boat length, in fact. And so it was uh, Holmberg who finally cruised to victory to go up 1-0 over Siri Eskin. Well, there we go. Sorry, Back that was uh, Holmberg to uh, tie it up, in fact. Yep. One to one. Less than three minutes to go now for the start of our next match. We're going to let you know exactly who that next match is. In just a few moments. Coming up on the two minute entry. Victor Sedieskin and Mons Holmberg in orange and green, which I believe will be our next 
Match? Nope. Just kidding. It is Sam Gilmore against Edrigan. Black boat is Gilmore. Light blue boat is Edrigan. Two-minute signal has just gone, and we're into the pre-start. That's interesting. Gilmore is tacked on to starboard as Edrigan enters the pre-start. Flows engage with him. Now he'll tack back. Edrigan will likely roll over his bow, and that has Gilmore into a trailing position as he rehoists the Jenniker. Big puff there as Edrigan puts his bow down. And he was he trying to get on to starboard there? I'm not too sure. But uh, it's Gilmore trailing with 105 to go as they get deeper in the box. Remember, this is a first to win two. This is the first time Marcus Edrigan has raced Sam Gilmore in the Super 16 as Edrigan goes for the hook. So Sam Gilmore to windward, must keep clear. Edrigan accelerating. Looks like he's got Gilmore. So Gilmore's got his rack up there um, inboard. Has uh, Gilmore done this uh, with enough time for a circle here? No, Edrigan uh, calls off the cavalry. Hmm. He is going around, though. Here comes the circle. 22 seconds to go. We've seen one team make this work and another one not. The difference was about one length on the starting line, and it was always within the 20-second mark. Now we're down to the 10-second mark, Scotty, and look at Edrigan accelerating. Can Gilmore get to the line in time? Oh, I think Gilmore's done this pretty well. There's only four seconds to go. Gilmore starting to fly a hull. And there's wow. the starting signal, both boats bow to bow. I mean, dead, even, and Sam Gilmore, what impressive time on distance to know he could turn away from the line and jive and get back to it. And as a lured boat, he's actually pulling forward underneath Edrigan for the lead. Well, he was just further away from the line, wasn't he? He had a nice ramp up, nice and smooth, and he was flying a hole early, and he's been flying a hole almost the whole time until right then. Big puff of breeze, it's a header. Wow, oh, look no, at blue. blue. Is he going up? Go is in? he going over? Total Stalling his unforced rudders. error. Wow, how about that? That puff came out of nowhere. You certainly couldn't see it on the water. No. Edrigan, Edrigan, sorry, almost capsized. Who would have thought in, in this light air you'd see a boat almost capsized, Scotty? No, not at all, but it just shows you the... Uh, the puffs rolling up and over the top of these buildings. You, you can't see them. And, and it is gusty out there. Uh, it, it looks incredibly light, but when the puffs come in, the, it's the difference in uh, pressure that's really challenging the team. So it's not, here's, here's, three, here's three knots, here's four. It's like, here's zero knots, and here's six. <laughs> so uh, here's Gilmore. We can certainly understand why the teams are uh, fighting hard to change gears. Well, not only did Gilmore win the start, but that massive puff caught Ed Edrigan, Edrigan, sorry, off guard, slowed them down, and Gilmore will convert that even to even more lead upwind. So now you can see Gilmore's team sailing upwind, team on the rack, no Jenica. So no Jenica uh, is an indication that the guys think there is enough pressure, enough breeze for the boat to be powered up without the need for the extra sail area. So the, uh, the Genic is used for additional power, but as soon as the boats are powered up, it literally just becomes more drag. So the, uh, it's a very uh, subjective changeover condition, but uh, Gilmore and his team sailing off to a nice lead. They look very relaxed there, don't they? It's, it's like they're cruising around in between races, but uh, I can assure you, they are sailing hard, and you can see the what the uh, the damage that they've done there. Gilmore around the top mark, and now a sizable lead over Edegren. So 
Sam Gilmore. Comfortably out in the lead. First to win two. If things stay as they are, he'll win one. To Marcus Edegren. U.S. So, team. So Edegren may be a little bit gun shy now with those big puffs rolling down. We saw him uh, really fly his windward hole, uh, shall we say, beyond control on the. Uh, That's a fair yep, analysis. Yep, on the first reach. Just watching them sail, they seem a bit out of sorts. You could see the traveler drop there, the boat healing too much, the Jenniker a bit out of sorts. Well, Here's a team that just I don't think is as practiced as perhaps Sam Gilmore is, who spends a lot of time training in these boats. Yeah, well, certainly Sam and his team, one of the more experienced teams out here, and they, uh, they make it look effortless, don't they? But it just goes to show you that even in light conditions, these boats uh, can be very challenging. That's uh, Gilmore on the final leg now, and uh, making it look very comfortable indeed. Flying a hole. Beautiful job. Race one goes to Sam Gilmore. Scotty, let's go back into the replay there of that near capsize. Look behind the light blue boat. So here's the puff, and it's almost like the rudders just let go. Something happened there. No, the main, sure. Look at the main leech. They oh, couldn't get okay. the main out. The main sheet, uh, now you see the crew member run down and ease it. So whatever they were doing, uh, yeah, <laughs> the boat just got overpowered too much, whatever too quick. Whatever they were doing, don't do that again. Don't do <laughs> that. And that's uh, coming from a half-cat sailor. So... Next up, we're going to have Wara and uh, Dakhammer in the pre-start. Excuse me. Back to Dakhammer. Up one, zero. To Jonas Wara. Three minutes to the start. That's the blue boat, Dakhammer, from Sweden. He will be entering below the signal boat. Water. We'll be entering above. Oh, I take that back. Water will enter on the leeward side. Deck hammer on the windward side. And that light blue boat's not in the match. For point of reference. 15 seconds to go to the two-minute entry period. One boat, Dak Hammer, has the Jenniker out. Powered up to full speed. Warrer will enter with no headsail. Flying a hull. And here we go. The two-minute signal underway in the pre-start. Warrer luffs up, closing the gauge immediately with Dak Hammer. Dak Hammer, meanwhile, is going to go deep down and look to get behind Warrer. He's done it, but not before Warrer accelerates away. And both boats now, Scotty, head down in, into that lower right-hand corner. The, first, the next move will be a jibe. Who will it be? Well, it's uh, Warrer really accelerated uh, away there, and you, you'll see him really uh, maneuvering the boat quite aggressively here to slow up. And... Um, burn the clock if you like he's he's gained the lured ground which is um what they uh, generally the um the boats have been fighting for so now he's gained that position now he's just trying to wind the clock down well the clock is down to one minute and counting water needs this match to stay in the regatta deck hammer sneaking into a lured position behind him going for the hook Big puff on uh, Dak Hammer there. It's like a big right hand shift. So there's there's Rex up and it's uh, Wara leading. And uh, nice yeah, Dak Hammer doing a good <laughs> job of staying away and he hasn't committed I think now perhaps he has has he rolled up and over the top he has 
He's been able to pull it off with only 12 seconds to go. Wow. Dak Hammer accelerating. Now he just needs to make sure he's not early, isn't it? He's in a very strong position. Is he a little early for the boat, maybe? Oh. Two, one. They oh, put the bows wow. down. He could be close to being over oh, early. Oh, that's got to be close. There's the signal. And it Has sounds, like, it? It sounds like all clear. The cameras are searching yeah, for, we can't for any signals, but it's all clear. Wow, so what a start. Dak I mean, Hammer with Dak precision Hammer. timing. If he wasn't over, Scotty, he was within a centimeter. And, and he, he, that's, that's what it takes. Look at the lead over water. Well, it wasn't just a centimeter, but it was a centimeter with no plan B. He had nowhere to go. He was committed to going that side of the committee boat. So uh, absolute precision timing by Nicholas Dackhammer. Perfect. And look at him now. So it's a two-boat length lead, maybe a little less coming into the first mark. Definitely a little less. One boat length. Wara coming on strong. This is tough racing, Tucker. I mean, uh, again, it's, it's not just about the start. It's also about staying in sync with the pressure, riding each puff down or analyzing each puff and trying to determine what uh, acceleration or wh which board you want to be on and what phase the breeze is in. There's so much going into it. So challenging for these teams for a completely different set of reasons than yesterday. I think Water could be in a somewhat strong position here, particularly if he does that, jibing early. So he's forced a difficult decision for Dakhammer, jibe and stay with him and, and risk being rolled or sail extra distance to the opposite mark. Well, there you go. It's going to be split gates, and it's Dakhammer around the lured mark first, but pretty even. And you're quite correct. It was Wara that rounded the right-hand mark, kept his speed on. So it was that uh, jibe away that gave him the leverage. So now they're exploring opposite sides of the course. And that's interesting. That's a, um, a jib being filled because they think there's enough pressure in that puff. Yep, and Wara doing the same thing from the right-hand side. Furling in attack, and Dakhammer will tack as well. Port starboard, it was bow to bow at the bottom of the track. Who will be ahead as the two teams converge here? So I think uh, that that puff was a right hand shift, but it seems to have breathed out again. So let's see who's going to come back with the advantage this time. It's Warra on starboard, Dakhammer on port, but look at Dakhammer. It's, it's pressure and it's left. He doesn't have his Jenica up. And that's, uh, I, I won't call it an easy cross, but nice conversion by Dakhammer. He, they had the right-hand pressure, and then they came in with the lefty as well. But now he tacks, and every little bit of that advantage will have been um, oh, trouble. absolutely the gone away. The windward sheet was caught there. They're having trouble getting their Jenica in. Now they're trying to get up to speed. Meanwhile, War around the top mark ahead, so another lead change. <laughs> It's Wara was able to lay the uh, the windward mark. I like that maneuver by Wara as well. Yep. Jiving immediately. Because he was slow going into the mark. So if he had stayed there, he certainly would have been rolled by Dak Hammer. So he uh, got out of there before he got into trouble. Now Dak Hammer continues with speed. It's basically almost even. Who's going to get the next puff? That'll determine who pulls into the lead on this final run. And I think right now, Warrer looks to be going faster. He does for sure, but uh, there is one more jive. That's the, uh, is that the Lewis Gate in the foreground there? Beautiful shot of the Peter and Paul Fortress as Warrer jibes onto starboard. Now we think he looked good on this side of the racetrack. I think he's got it. He's slow, but he, he's on starboard. And the other reason for playing the side, Tucker, Oh, no, it's Dak Hammer jiving in front, but how's he going to get down to the lured mark from there? It's going to be Warra that will control the inside. And with speed, he may even pull forward and break free of the wind shadow that Dak Hammer tried to place on top of Warra. So the lead boat still is Jonas Warra. One more turn to go. And it looks as though he's got it. Into the last turning mark. There's the guest racer aboard. The hot seat, they call it here in M32 Racing. 
I don't know how exactly how hot that seat is today. Yeah, any further forward and it wouldn't be hot at all, would it? <laughs> I mean, look at how close Dockhammer is. But not enough. Look at the acceleration now from Jonas Water. There's the finish line, far right of screen, the white and black checkered buoy. Just off the shoreline here in St. Petersburg, off of the Peter and Paul Fortress. A first to win two. Dakhammer took first blood over Jonas Warrer, and Jonas Warrer will return the favor, evening the score at one all. Some of these matches, Scotty, even this very light conditions are pretty nail biters, pretty exciting, I mean. Well, they're, uh, they're nail biters for, uh, for, for the reason that the, um, you know, the boats accelerate and, you know, they uh, equally as quick as they accelerate, they, they decelerate as well. So, as we said earlier, it is an absolute minefield out there and you can't necessarily see the puffs coming down the racetrack because we're um, obscured by uh, the beautiful Winter Palace. But uh, it really is leading to uh, a, a lot of changes in, in lead and, and uh, control. One minute, 45 seconds to go. Our next match is Mons Holmberg from Sweden and Victor Sedieskin from Russia, both tied at one all. Minute 35 to go, Holmberg leading on port. The lower right-hand corner of the start box before jiving. Sedieskin reeling him in. Close to pin lay line. Holmberg. So far in control. Sedieskin jiving to windward. And I think that's going to give the advantage to Holmberg if he can stay hooked to Lewert. Kenny? Yeah, so they're, uh, they're a lot higher in the box, I believe, than we've seen the other pairs with a lot of time to go. It's uh, Sedieskin trying to trying to roll down and over the top of Holmberg here. So I wonder if Sarievskin's just trying to get Holmberg hooked to Lewis so he can do that uh, tack and jibe around maneuver. Certainly plenty of time for that, but Holmberg, um, yeah, doing a good job of staying away and in fact taking that option away from Sarievskin. So uh, Sarievskin now closer to the starting line but has Holmberg timed it so that he can have a better ramp up, longer acceleration, and come flying in? That's the pin, the yellow buoy, right hand side of screen where Sedieskin is so approaching here we go. slowly. Yep. We can expect to see Holmberg deploy first because he's got more runway to play with. Let's see how he plays his time and distance. Three, two, here they go. It's Holmberg already deployed. Bowed down and across the starting line, Sarievskin slow to accelerate, and there it is. Awesome work by Holmberg. He knew exactly what he was doing. He had a little more runway to play with, pulled the trigger a little earlier, and Holmberg out to an early lead. See, both boats get hit by that puff, but I think the trimmers, perhaps not as experienced on uh, Sarievskin's boat. They kept the sheets in too much, it healed too much, and then they eased it too much, and then Hall came slamming down. Meanwhile, Holmberg's heel, perfect the whole time through that puff. There's the difference. Two and a half length advantage to Holmberg around mark one. Yeah, the, the good teams make it look very easy and, and, and effortless, don't they? But I can assure you, even in the slide air, the teams are working very hard to keep the boats at their maximum performance. I like Sadieskin's early jibe there, and Holmberg yep. jibes to stay with him. Sadieskin is close to reeling him in. It's a right-hand shift from behind. Ooh. The advantage goes to the trailing boat in match racing. And can Sadieskin catch up and even the score? Can he get hooked inside the zone here at the bottom of the track? Does he have the overlap? I think he had to slow down. He did have Whoa. the overlap, or at least Holmberg gave it to him. And I think that was the right thing to do. Oh, contact right there. Lured boat is the orange one. Holmberg, there's going to be a penalty on it. Now, did Holmberg give Sadieskin enough room to keep clear, enough time? Umpires into the call. Yellow flag. Holmberg did not. And he cops the penalty. Yeah, that too was aggressive. a little too aggressive by Holmberg. And then they got to the boundary. And now Sadieskin's going to sail away to a, uh, 
a, a nice advantage here. I think Holmberg will be a, a little disappointed at the uh, over-aggression there, we'll call it. And in the meantime, Seriefskin uh, flying a hole. And uh, remember, we've seen Holmberg just a little bit smoother with their maneuvers. And I think Holmberg, he's already been able to absolve his penalty and already back into it. I, Seriefskin trying to lay the top mark, and he's going to lay the top mark with the current. You can see the boats moving left to right on the screen, but Holmberg's going to be right back in this race. So uh, this is definitely not over yet. As both boats round the uh, top mark for the final time, it's going to be Holmberg accelerating a little earlier and straight into a jibe. Wow. You can see another lead change here. Holmberg jibing first into a right-hand puff and accelerating. And now he's back out in front with a hull flying. So and now Sardieskin gets his bow into some breeze. Scotty, there's nothing in this match. Holmberg's going to have to jibe again. Sardieskin might lay down. Who's your money on? Who's going to have it in the final turning mark? Well, we've seen this before, haven't we? And it's the, the boat uh, closest to the beach, the boat on the left of the screen. Uh, on starboard, but they're going to have inside rights at the leeward gate. And speed, so all by the looks of it. All Sarajevskin can do is sail deep and follow Holmberg around. So you can expect to see Holmberg to do the slow carve here and keep his speed up. He That's exactly that what he's done. Or beautifully, beautifully done. And Sarajevskin still, still very slow and uh, working to get around the mark, fighting that current. I mean, you got Holmberg sail that last leg perfectly and he, just sent Sadieskin back. He really did. And that's where you see the uh, just the smallest things and the, you know, a little bit smoother on the maneuvers can make a huge difference. And boy, did Holmberg make that look easy. He certainly did. And there it is. Mons Holmberg had to fight for it, but he's earned it. He goes up 2-1 over Victor Sadieskin and moves on into the quarterfinals of Match Cup Russia. Well, great racing, isn't it? I mean, uh, a lot of these races, we are just um, seeing that it's it's not about the start, it's not about the first leg, but it, it's it's the full race that counts. In this case, it also was about that lured mark with the collision. Scotty, take us through it. Here's the replay. Well, here we go, and it was, uh, I believe, Holmberg on the outside there. Seriewskin was entitled to room, but you can see right here, Holmberg with quite a hard luff came up. There's the contact, mm. and it's whole on rack and Holmberg's team kind of saying to the umpires, hang on, he didn't keep clear, but really uh, Holmberg didn't give Sarajevskin uh, a lot of room to keep clear. There a lot of opportunity. So it was Holmberg that caught the penalty and um, Holmberg took the penalty, um, dropped back, but then uh, got back into the race and uh, it was close on the last downwind, but Holmberg finally uh, cruising to a victory. A well-earned one and an exciting match. In a few moments, the pre-start between Sam Gilmore and Marcus Edegrand, but first we're under postponement. Looks like they have to fix something on one of the boats, Scotty. And then we'll be back shortly for the pre-start. Can we look? One thing we can do while we're waiting here, Scotty, is confirm the scores overall when we're ready. We'll pull that up, bring everybody up to speed on where the racing is thus far here in St. Petersburg as the Super 16 round continues here in Match Cup Russia.
Matthias Dahlstrom, principal race officer with the AP postponement flag up while the repair crew jumps into action here on the water. Let's take a look at the scores as they stand so far. Jan Guichard 2-0 over Lucas Wasinski. Kim Kling went down 2-1 to one to Peter Jan Postma from the Netherlands. Ian Williams wrapped up Nico De La Carth 2-0. Sally Barco sadly lost all of her matches, 3-0 to Matt Jerwood. Victor Sedieskin, the local Russian team, went down 2-1 to, to Mons Holmberg. Jonas Warrer and Nicholas Dackhammer are tied still at one all, so we're going to see that match. Phil Robertson beat Stephen Thomas, but he had to fight 3-2 to, to do it. And then finally, Sam Gilmore is only one point up over Marcus Edegran from the United States. So two more matches in play this afternoon in St. Petersburg. Scotty, I know you're checking your notes. You got the scores correct? Of course. Uh, fantastic racing, Tucker, and uh, it really is changing fortunes out there. Every, every leg counts, every maneuver counts, and uh, we're starting to see the races go closer, well, should we say being decided closer and closer to the finish line, to the point where it's, uh, it's the, the last lured mark that, uh, that really uh, has a lot of relevance, and we've seen some penalties and, um, and lead changes at the very final gate. And look at this venue, Scotty. I know you've match raced at venues all over the world. This is the first time the tour has come to St. Petersburg. And what do you think of the racing here in front of this historic city? Oh, this is absolutely incredible, Tucker. I mean, uh, as you've suggested, uh, we've both had some pretty nice views from our office window. And look at that, spectacular steeples and spires of St. Petersburg. But this, um, yeah, we, we've had some great views around the world, but this place, um, Truly special, and as you say, steeped in steeped in history and uh, and and culture, and uh, fascinating place. So many views, and um, yeah, ho hoping to get a little bit of time off um, or time after the regatta's done to go see some more of the city. So much of it to see, and. Uh, I like that floating restaurant we saw, that old ship that we noticed in the opening of the show. Scotty, you actually pointed it out. Maybe we'll get a camera shot of it. The pirate ship. The pirate ship restaurant. I saw that coming in. <laughs> you think if we put them in the show, Scotty, they'll give us a free dinner? <laughs> there it is. Hooray. Now, I saw the name of that restaurant, but I couldn't pronounce it. It's a historic ship, floating restaurant here in St. Petersburg. All the restaurants we've been to have been fantastic. What a great view. We haven't seen that shot before, so that's from the top of the Peter Paul Fortress looking back down across our uh, WMRT village. Yeah, give the, give the camera guys credit. In fact, exactly. this is a good time to give all of the World Match Racing Tour TV production credit. Look at that. For the great job. Look, look at that. This could be a tourist video. Beautiful work. In case you can't tell, we're still under postponement. Waiting for the next match to begin. Only two more matches in play here in the Super 16 round of Match Cup Sweden. Next matchup, Sam Gilmore in the Black Boat versus Edegren from the United States. Gilmore currently up 1-0. Again, these matches are the first to two points. 
We had uh, a couple of the early matches were first to three points, and then the race committee determining that um, due to uh, due to the conditions and basically lost time, the format had to be shortened for the um, remaining matches in the Super 16 of the WMRT stop off here in St. Petersburg, Russia. So Gilmore 1 0 up, first to two points. Edegren in a must win situation. Again, beautiful backdrop. I've uh, said that so many times, and I'm sure I'll be uh, continuing to say that. But every direction we look in in this city, it's uh, absolutely breathtaking. Coming up on the two minute signal. Edegrand representing the hopes of the United States here in Russia. And Gilmore trying to keep his match racing star father proud, watching down under from Australia. And here we go, Scotty, the two minute signal has sounded off the committee boat. Gilmore to windward here in black. Edegrand, light blue, and we're into the pre start. Early jibe, or at least bow down by Gilmore, an aggressive move to get down behind. Look how slow Edegran is, just trying to not allow any room for Gilmore to make that move work. Then he'll accelerate away and break the overlap. And this is one of the more aggressive entries we've seen so far. Yeah, so that was uh, definitely Gilmore taking the action to Edegran. Um, as you'd expect, I mean, Gilmore, um, if he feels like he's going to be stronger with the boat handling, particularly in the pre-starts, he's not just going to sit back and, you know, rely on boat speed, etc. But uh, you can see Gilmore has a protest. I'm not sure what the protest would be. Was it Edegrin not keeping clear, perhaps? Was there okay, a penalty? Okay, so Edegrin now putting his bow up and accelerating. He's going to roll over the top of Gilmore here. So let's see what the umpires say. I'm not sure who was hailing protest, but interesting. Okay, well, it, it sounded like uh, perhaps it was a, a yellow penalty where it went up and then came down again. But anyway, it's uh, Edegrin now has taken the lead away from Gilmore. Now Gilmore doing the same to Edegrin <laughs> up and over the top with 22 seconds to go. And Gilmore keeping the high ground. He thinks they're far enough back that he's going to be able to accelerate on Edegrin's breeze. Green flag from the umpires from the earlier incident. Five seconds to go. I'm surprised Edegrin should have deployed a little earlier there, but bow down, and there they go. Both boats close to the line. Edegrin a little closer, but Sam Gilmore really starting to power up, flying a hull. Just nothing in it between these two boats, neck and neck, bow to bow, dead even. The Edig leeward boat of Edegrin coming up, coming up. Gilmore's going to have to keep clear, trying to get over his bow. Is there contact? At this point, no. Look at that beautiful move by Sam Gilmore, and he'll take an early lead into mark number one. So much discipline and good Stand by. judgment. Could be a penalty. We're listening in, and yeah, we're trying to so see. Yeah, so it looks like Sam Gilmore slowing down. So, oh. yeah, he was windward boat, did not keep clear. I was about to give him credit for, <laughs> uh, you know, good judgment. But it was um, Edegrin did a wonderful job. He turned uh, his good start position into um, something uh, to really make Sam Gilmore pay the price. Now he accelerates away. So you'll expect to see the blue flag to go down any second. There it comes. And it hasn't gone down yet, and indicating, now. okay, so now Sam Gilmore's done his penalty, but look at Edegrin accelerate away, so. And look at Gilmore job. coming on with pace from behind this match, far from over. Edegrin leaning back, driving with the stock part oh, of the look at there. this. Whoa, so, no, no, so what happened there? Edegrin rounded the lured mark with his Jenica, and Sam Gilmore said, no, nope, it's, uh, Breezy enough, we don't need it. So, uh, no, that was interesting. But Edegrin is, uh, he's hung on to the lead. 
And this time he is deploying his Jenica again, but Sam Gilmore is not. So maybe this is Gilmore's, um, there's the power up. Oh, look at that. A little Big bit of pump. weight up and man, changing fortunes again. I was about to say is Sam Gilmore's experience in these boats gonna start to show, but this is a great shot here. You've got one boat with the Jenica out, nicely powered up, and the other boat with no Jenica, um, sailing in a, in a different mode. So Gilmore is going to have to tack to lay the top mark here. And here comes the Jenniker. Nope, just to back for the tack. So two, you're right, Scotty, two different modes there. And have we got an overlap coming into the zone? Can Gilmore take the mark? It looks like he can. So Gilmore coming in on port, he says, I'll take wow. the left mark. Thank you very much. And again, Edegren just uh, mm -hmm. a little bit un... Just disorganized with the crew work. I mean, but this is some of the best match racing we've seen all day. No surprise, the breeze has finally built, and so has the action. Yeah, excellent work by Gilmore. He knew exactly what he was doing. Came in on port, got to the zone, said, I want the mark, and I'm going to force you to do the extra maneuver. And you can see now Edegren really uh, paying the price for being forced to tack at right. exactly the wrong time. So and now look at Gilmore's I mean, lead. He is just flying downwind. 10, 12, 13 boat lengths and counting. Gilmore takes that check to the bank and cashes it all the way home into the last turning mark. And Gilmore had to work for it, but what a fantastic match this one has been. Oh, he turned that into uh, a, a close race, into some, um, some pretty big punishment. And I, I wouldn't even call it Edegren's mistake. It was just uh, Gilmore's experience and discipline. And uh, he's now on to the final leg. Boy, did he make that look easy. And there is the difference as Edegren continues to sail down towards the leeward mark. Gilmore already won his first match. And this will seal the deal and send the Australian team into the quarterfinals. Congratulations, Sam Gilmore and crew. What an impressive win. Edegren knows his ticket back home is coming up. Not the only American to be sent home from Russia these days. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there he'll cross the line. That's one of the better matches we've seen this afternoon, Scott, here on the Never River in St. Petersburg. Yeah, well, that was fascinating, wasn't it? Because they came around the Lured Mark and Edegren sailed the, uh, the final upwind beat with his Jenica. Gilmore did not. And it looked very, very even in modes, but it was um, Gilmore that uh, able to sail, he was able to sail high, tack onto port. He got into that zone. Um, which means that he owned the inside of the mark turning left. And um, not sure that Edegren had a uh, game plan in play, but certainly Gilmore came in, knew exactly what he was doing, um, forced, uh, forced Edegren to tack away. And uh, from there on, it was, it was literally uh, plain sailing for Gil Gilmore. He slowed up Ed uh, Edegren while he accelerated away and... Uh, very well done by Sam Gilmore and his team. All right, well, let's relive some of that match. It was all exciting, but it happened right here in the start. Here's some starts, Scotty. Yeah, well, this was fantastic. It was uh, uh, Edegren to, um, to Leward. The Gilmore was over oh. early. Okay, well, that's, oh, that's the start the, and the finish. That, that was the finish. That was the fastest match race replay we've seen <laughs> yep. this afternoon. Yeah, I, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that was the start. I could be mistaken, but, uh, yeah, the, um, yeah no, the, the race was great because um, it was uh, Edegren had the, had the lured position. Gilmore thought he was going to roll him on the first leg and didn't quite get away with it, and Gilmore got penalized. So, uh, yeah, great race. Uh, penalties, lead changes, massive shifts, different modes. Um, fantastic racing. Just getting, 
Just getting an announcement from the race committee here. Okay, so that's Matthias Dahlstrom, the PRO, Principal Race Officer, telling us that we are still going to be under a delay. And just one more match in play out on the water. Nicholas Dachhammer and Jonas Warrer. So there we are waiting to uh, start the final match. Sudden death, they're both tied at one all. As the Super 16 winds down here in St. Petersburg. There are your two teams, the only two boats left out on the race course. Duck Hammer in blue, and Warrer will be in red. Breeze is still light, but it has evened up and picked up just a little bit across the race course, and that's increased the maneuverability of these boats, Scotty, and that's why we're seeing a lot closer pre-starts and a lot closer matches than we had in the fluky, patchy minefield conditions of this morning. Yeah, definitely, definitely giving us some entertainment. Yeah, definitely um, some more aggressive maneuvers and teams and engaging in the pre-start. And a few more penalties. So well, that got, last match um, was uh, so exciting. We're going to go relive it with the man himself. Sam Gilmore out on the water is ready for an interview with us. Sam, can you hear us? Yeah, Tucker, hearing you loud and clear. Take us through that last race, man. What an exciting match. What a nail-biter, and you guys definitely earned it. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks, Tucker. It was uh, definitely hard fought. I mean, we, uh, we thought we nailed the start and felt a bit unfortunate to get that penalty. You know, it was a, it was a close one, and had we been sort of another half metre apart, we would have just rolled straight over him. So uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. But, you know, we're sailing both fast. We're feeling good. Yeah, hi Sam, Scotty here, uh, well done. It was interesting on that um, second beat, it looked like, um, well obviously you were sailing with no Jenica, they were sailing with a Jenica, and it seemed to be a pretty good crossover condition. Yeah, I mean, that's a really tough decision to make, mostly, um, you know, um, it, it's really tricky conditions out here, but the, the guys, um, Justin on the float court, made a really good call to you sail without the Jenica and I think uh, in the end that was the right mode of BMG which I did feel a little bit, a bit low but we came out of the tack flying so that was a good call by him. Yeah clearly well well done to you and your team Sam it certainly seemed to be your mode on that last beat that uh, gave you the initiative at the top mark so uh, well done and good luck for the next round. Yeah thanks Scotty Tucker looking forward to it. Well there you go that was uh, Sam Gilmore cementing his place in the top eight over, uh, over Edegren from the USA. And uh, I'm not sure, I think we might be in a, uh, in a delay at the moment. The race committee is just confirming with Wara and Dakhammer, seeing if they are ready to go. So. I like that. Matthias Dahlstrom checking in with both teams. America's Cup does the same thing. And each team with a radio can talk to the race committee. Communication makes things go a lot more efficient. Matthias is ready to send the racing off. And according to that radio transmission, so are the two teams. Nicholas Dachhammer once again. And Jonas War tied at one all in a first to win two. Sudden death match, the final match to determine the Super 16. There's the signal boat in the center of the screen, just behind Wars' red boat. Momentarily, we'll be waiting for the four minute signal.
Now I believe the other boat's out on the race course. Scotty means that we are going to roll right into the quarterfinals after this match. There's the gun, four minutes to go. And the quarterfinals will be a best of three, first to win five, and we'll go back to that format with your top eight sailors here in Match Cup Russia. There's Water to windward. He'll enter above the signal boat in a minute and 40 seconds. That's Dackheimer in the center of screen in blue. Scotty, any idea on who you'd put your money on in this match? No, I, uh, I, I really don't. Thanks for uh, putting me on the spot yeah, there, you Tucker. Under, sorry, <laughs> threw you under the bus there. No, it's, uh, it's, it's too close to, to call, and uh, it's the, um, the, the teams, all the teams are sailing well enough that a little puff here and a little, little shift there just uh, really converts into um, big uh, changes in advantage. And, down to the three minute signal and uh, we were saying earlier, you can get four out of five puffs or shifts correct, but um, that's almost not enough on a day like today in a venue like this. Absolutely treacherous out there and no lead is big enough. Who's your, who's your money on, Tucker? In the last uh, regatta, Nicholas Darkheimer in these light conditions outsailed Matt Jerwood to finish in the quarterfinals of uh, Match Cup Sweden a month ago. So by virtue of that, I think I'm going to go with him. But as you say, Scotty, with these two teams, each has taken a win. Very fluky conditions. It's pretty much anybody's guess. But I'll take Dachhammer for a shot of Russian vodka. You take the bet? Of course. We try to make bets here on the TV relative to the country that we're in. Purely for cultural reasons. I usually of lose <laughs> and buy the drinks. But, Scotty, hopefully, for me, this one will be on you if Warrer can win. Dockheimer in blue, Warrer in red. Two minute signals underway, and here we go into the pre start. Both boats have entered with Jennikers up. And there's one of those nice little random puffs that we see uh, coming down around the buildings, and it's Warrer that gets it flying a hull. And you can see there, that's nice tasty breeze, isn't it? We haven't seen one of those puffs for a <laughs> while. So that uh, really gets the boats uh, into the, um, the pre-start box and uh, advanced early, if you like. So they just burned up a lot of runway. And I think that um, takes a bit of the advantage away from Dak Hammer. Wara put his bow up and he's rolled over the top of Dak Hammer. So now he's trying to gain the lured ground. So now Dak Hammer will be trying to stay away. He doesn't, well, does he want to get locked to lure there? Maybe. Is he over his bow? Tough to tell. Yeah, no, War is definitely clear ahead. So now it's all about the acceleration. And you can see some fish tailing going on. 40 seconds to go, they're quite deep. So I think uh, Wara in the stronger position here at the moment. Has Dak Hammer come back early enough to tack around and do the tack jibe maneuver? It's a nice maneuver by Wara. Putting Dak Hammer up against the ropes. Only 23 seconds to go to the start. Is Dak Hammer hooked away from the line or can he accelerate over the top of Wara? He's got they, only 15 seconds to do it, he's in trouble. They both look pretty even there, so that tells me that Dak Hammer's got the initiative. You see him unfurl first, so that's an indication that he's gonna accelerate first. So I'm gonna call this first blood to Wara. Yep. There's the start. And not really the flying start that oh we've been lead to. Boy, did I get that. that one wrong. So did I, Dak Hammer. Is Dak Hammer just um, putting Rolling the bow over. down and ripping away. I so think a bit of right-hand shift helped him out there, and Puff, not Puff sure, hit his boat first. Not sure how he did that, but he just turned what appeared to be nothing from us into um, definitely something to celebrate. So he's bow out, flying, and he's still opening out, isn't he? Fantastic job. Man, Three I, and a half uh, lengths and counting. Still outspeeding war into mark number one. And this for a shot of Russian vodka, Scotty. So far, I'm, I'm looking good. So far, you're getting thirsty. <laughs> I understand. But look, he continues to gain, though. It's more than just that one puff at the start. 
He's outspeeded Wara the entire leg, and the distance now is five lengths. Finally, Wara gets a puff of breeze to start reeling in some of that distance. So this is where we see the, uh, the lead boat have its lead eroded so quickly. But it was a deck hammer that got his jibe in. Is uh, Warrior going to have to jibe for the other gate? Let's see how we go. Dakham are very low, very slow there. Warrior jibing now. Let's see what happens here. Let's see if uh, Warrior gets a little speed going. He is. He's flying a hole. There's a big puff. Look at Warrior just take off there. And Dakhammer very Whoa. slow indeed. This might be a lead change coming up. And Look at that. Wow, Wara around the Lewid mark ahead, and he just... There goes my shot. He did a wonderful job there, didn't he? He uh, kept the boat going, jived into a puff, came out, hit the right angle. And now oh, he man. thinks it's a big right shift, so he's straight into attack. And Dakhammer, wow, hard to, hard to believe that uh, they're, they're still struggling to accelerate, aren't they? So... Dakhammer just completely out of sync with the breeze. Mm, and look at Warrer in sync, in a puff, in a right hand shift, having already tacked, he is gone upwind. Wow. What kind of um, uh, Russian vodka do you like, Scotty? <laughs> the free kind from the Utaka. <laughs> so, uh, again, fascinating race. We've already seen it go inside out twice. Um, fantastic. That is quite a sizable lead now, isn't it? So as long as the pressure is up, the lead boat will feel quite confident. Confident it's enough. Penalty. Hang on. Hang on, there's a stop and go penalty. On, on yellow. On which boat? Ah, oh, I'm Dak definitely Hammer, not so going to win this bet. Oh, an unforced error there as Dakhammer slowing down. However, I say that and look at Warrer having tack there. He's slow at the top of the track. Dakhammer trying to get his bow up to speed after that penalty, but not before Warrer deploys the Jenniker, still out in front on the final run. And that's a nice puff uh, to get Warrer around the top mark and really uh, propel him down this, um, you know, th these downwind legs are so tricky, so any, any puff you get to convert into um, downwind VMG is so valuable. It just really limits the, uh, the opportunity for the trailing boat to attack on this particular leg. It's the downwind legs where we've seen um, a lot of the lead changes. Certainly the first downwind leg on this, uh, on this race uh, turned it inside out. So Warren not going too far this way. He'll be happy to jibe while he has pressure. And with that, my hopes of Russian vodka are deteriorating. Towards the finish line, beautiful job coming from behind. Jonas War, one more jibe to go. Duckhammer coming on strong with a bit of breeze, but will it be enough to catch up and then get overlapped and then pass his opponent before the finish? I don't think so. So that was uh, the final jibe for Wara. And Dak Hammer was coming in with speed, but uh, it was a nice job by Warra. Got back up to speed quickly onto the reaching leg. Team up on the racks. He'll be feeling good about this victory, uh, Tucker, as am I. <laughs> well done, Jonas Warra and crew from Denmark. The final race this afternoon here in St. Petersburg. And the final boat that will move on into the quarters is Jonas War. Congratulations, well sailed two to one over Nicholas Dachheimer. Dachheimer. And they know it. They've earned it. 18 boats were whittled down to 16 and now we have our top eight of Match Cup Russia. What a match, Scotty. Oh, absolutely. And uh, that match really, um, summarizes, typifies uh, so many of the matches we've seen today where uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the start, it's the boat speed, it's the tactics and the rules. Man, Warra doing a good job with uh, all of those in that particular instance. Well, let's see where the lead change occurred at the lured mark. Scotty, here we go. 
So here we go. This is where uh, I think Dak Hammer jibed, realised he couldn't get down to the bottom mark, had to kind of jibe and go slow again, and Warra just came flying in, got around his bow, and really um, that was the, the, the pivotal moment. Warra cruising across the finish line, you can see how happy they are there to make the final eight, downing a formidable opponent in Nicholas Dackhammer. And there it is, Warra moving on into the quarterfinals. Scotty earning himself a free shot of Russian vodka. Congratulations. So let's take a look at the scores as they stand so far. As we mentioned, your top eight have moved on. It will be Jan Gishard outsailed Lucas Wasinski. He'll move on. Peter John Postma will move on over Kim Kling. Ian Williams is into the quarterfinals. He outsailed Nico De La Carth and Matt Jerwood will join them as well, having sailed outsailed Sally Barco. The other four are Mons Holmberg over Victor Sedieskin. Jonas Warrer outsailed Nicholas Dackheimer in that last race. And what a nail biter it was. Phil Robertson, the world champion. He'll go in, oh, into the quarterfinals over Stephen Thomas. And finally, Sam Gilmore has outsailed Marcus Edegran from the United States to join the top eight here in Match Cup Russia. Now we're ready for an interview down on the water with Jonas Warrer. Let's see if he can hear us. Jonas, are you out there? Can you hear us? This is Tucker Thompson with the commentary. I can hear you. First of all, great job. What a fantastic race. You kept us guessing all the way around the track. Tell us about that lured mark where you were able to gain the lead. Yeah, I guess uh, we, uh, we just kept the, the boat going. And, uh, well, in this type of boat, you just can't soak it for very long. And, and we succeeded in just keeping the speed all around. And, and luckily... Uh, just uh, passed him on, on that one. Yes, yeah, Scotty Dixon here. Uh, congratulations. Um, so you're feeling um, feeling good with boat speed. You, you think it's boat speed or more tactical on a day like today? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, it's not very much about boat speed out here. Um, with these uh, really shifty conditions, um, uh, you just have to be at the right uh, right spot at the right time and, and just really look out the boat and see what's coming at you and just uh, use, use what you got. Okay, well, congratulations on making the next round. Uh, very well sailed and, uh, and uh, good sailing and good job being in the right place at the right time. Thank you. Well, that'll do it. And now let's summarize once again your top eight who are into the quarterfinals. Jan Guichard, Sam Gilmore will face each other tomorrow. We believe it's going to be a first to win three. We move back to that format. format. Matt Sherwood and Mons Holmberg. Ian Williams will face Jonas Warr, who we just heard from. And Peter Jan Postma will go up against Phil Robertson. That is going to be an exciting match. And there are your top eight, the quarterfinals of Match Cup Russia. What a fantastic day of racing it has been this afternoon. Here in historic St. Petersburg, day number four of Match Cup Russia has come to a close. I'm Tucker Thompson along with Scott Dixon. Plenty more action to come here in St. Petersburg. Join us tomorrow and you can also follow the action on social media and live on Facebook and WMRT.com. Live from 2 p.m. around the world. So long from St. Petersburg. We'll see you tomorrow.